Thank you for watching GCTV's coverage of the Rural Public Health and Healthcare Legislative Hearing. Visit our website at gctv.org to watch a rebroadcast of this program. My name is Jill Comerford. I have the honor of representing the Franklin Worcester District in the State Senate. Uh, I am welcoming you on behalf of Chair John Mahoney. He is the House Chair of the Joint Committee on Public Health, where I am the Senate Chair. Uh, Chair Mahoney is an amazing partner, and I believe together with our teams, we have a very strong uh, and actually very, very productive public health committee. So please, you know, allow me on behalf of Chair Mahoney and the Joint Committee on Public Health to warmly welcome you here to this hearing, which we are focusing on rural public health. Now, this is different from a state house hearing where we'll talk about some bills. You might hear some, some reflection on some bills, but today we're going deep on an issue, and we're going deep on an issue that's of critical importance, of course, to us here in Western Massachusetts, but of course around the Commonwealth. And so today will be a, a mixture of the issue so that Boston, so that our public health team uh, can focus in, um, and so that um, the leadership in the House and the Senate can focus in on this critical issue and use it as a lens for us when we make policy, when we make budget decisions, uh, to use the ideas, the challenges, and the opportunities here in Western Massachusetts as a lens to maybe make sure that we're always thinking when we're thinking health care, uh, we're thinking, huh, how does that square in rural Western Massachusetts or rural parts of the Cape, as we'll hear. Um, I'm also wanting to welcome people who are watching this on the live stream. So today there are people in the state house watching it. We're often the reverse, right? We're watching out here uh, things that are transpiring in Boston today. Boston staff and colleagues are watching what happens here. Um, please let me say how delighted I am to be joined by Representative Dan Carey. Uh, Senator Adam Hines is on his way, as, as, as is Representative Natalie Blay. Um, we are joined here also with staff, by staff, um, from San, uh, Senator Ann Gobi's office, Senator Jim Welch's office, um, Senator Representative uh, Sabados's office, I believe, um, or on their way, and Representative Whip's office. We also have incredible staffers and uh, um, leadership from Chair Mahoney's uh, Public Health Committee. So we have Eric Mayberg here, um, and we have uh, Kate Alicante here, who are part of um, Chair Mahoney's team in the State House. I also have a team here. Um, General Counsel Legislative Director uh, Brian Rossman is here, and we also have uh, what we call public health fellows. I call them the Brain Trust. Um, we have Grace and Samin, Olivia, Mike, and Maria, um, and my staff um, constituent engagement director, Sam Hopper, uh, who I have no end of gratitude um, for Sam. I want to do a huge and big passionate shout out to Phoebe Walker uh, and Linda Dunlavy from the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. What you're seeing today is really a mind meld um, of Phoebe and Linda and uh, the, the public health team. Um, it's also made possible um, thanks to donations from, uh, we're feeding you today, thanks to donations from Bay State and Cooley Dickinson. Um, it's important to have food at public gatherings. We don't do that in the State House, but we can do it in Western Massachusetts. Um, and on that topic, oh, please eat. Um, because we did, uh, although we didn't dream that we'd get this room this full, we did order food for as many of you as who are here. So, why, you know, so I started to talk about why we're here. Um, and Linda and Phoebe are going to talk in much greater depth about uh, the rural plan that they just helped um, birth for us. Today we're focusing on that healthcare piece of it and bringing it to life. Um, we're going to hear about the challenges and the opportunities in more than 170 rural communities in our Commonwealth. Um, oh, I have one minute. Um, and so the Massachusetts Rural Advisory uh, Commission just created this rural policy plan. And we are bringing this public health articulation of it uh, to life in this hearing, again, so that we in the public health committee uh, can make informed decisions based on what we hear today, based on um, the Rural Advisory Commission's plan, based on what you say and your questions you ask um, and the comments you make, based on our amazing panelists. 
So again, this is a complete collaboration. Um, this delegation, the agencies and organizations represented here on the panel and in the audience, you are what makes our region incredibly special. I will say that we may be small in number out here in Western Massachusetts, but we are mighty in impact in Boston. And that is because we have a delegation that wants to work together. You'll notice if you come to the State House that often it's the legislators facing out and the panelists facing in with their back to you. We're flipping that around because we want you to see who's up here. And we also want the live stream to see what, who's up here. Um, and so the people speaking today are gonna speak out. Um, the legislators and staff are facing. Um, and we are gonna invite questions from the legislators and staff, from the public health staff, from the public health fellows, from the legislators who are present. But then we're also, as time permits, I'm gonna invite questions and your calm and reactions from you all. Um, and we're gonna keep it moving because we have a really beautiful and packed agenda for today. Um, so that's one of the ways. So we're gonna flip the direction and we're gonna invite your participation in the hearing. Again, different than what you might be expecting um, from Boston. We have five panels um, today uh, and each of the panels, thanks to Grace, will stay on time because we're gonna be really uh, careful about the time so that you all will get to hear as many people as you possibly can. Uh, so we're gonna stay on time, including me. Um, and just one little bit of housekeeping. Um, in addition to the food, please just know that there are uh, bathrooms right out here. Um, Mike in the back is part of our pu public health brain trust. Um, and Mike will answer any questions or logistics. Um, Sam is here up front, also able to answer any questions or logistics. Um, we are live streaming from the Senate page. So if you wanna help boost the signal of today's hearing, um, you can, and, um, and first, First and foremost, thank you to GCTV for making this possible. This is no uh, easy thing to do, to live stream a hearing. Um, you can share from the Senate page, um, or you can find us on Twitter. And that way, not only will the people hearing in Boston hear us, not only will we put together a report, which we will, um, which we'll send throughout the building, um, but you can help be the kind of booster that we need. So. Without further ado, um, I'm going to welcome up uh, Linda Dunlavy, who's the director, the executive director of the Franklin Regional Council of Governments and Phoebe Walker. They're gonna talk to us uh, to kick us off um, and lay the foundation from this Rural Advisory Commission and talk about the process and how today fits into this much larger, much larger, much more vigorous piece of work to get the kind of regional equity for our regional communities and our rural communities that you all, we deserve. Linda. Hi everyone, if, if you have an open chair next to you, will you raise your hand? And for the people, so there's two chairs, is that really it, two chairs? All right, we'll try to get you more chairs for all of you standing. So I'm going to tell you about the Rural Policy Plan. Phoebe's going to get into more depth on one of the chapters, public health and health care. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about is the Rural Policy Advisory Commission, how we created the plan, and uh, give you some highlights. I'll also fly through some demographics so that you're grounded on rural Massachusetts. So the Rural Policy Advisory Commission was created by legislation in 2015. The mission of the Rural Policy Advisory Commission is to enhance the economic vitality of rural communities. The commission is made up of a member of, this, of the House, which is Representative Paul Mark, designee from the Senate President's Office, and then there are 15 gubernatorial appointments, which includes a member from each of the rural regional planning agencies in Massachusetts. Rural, by legislation, is defined as a community with a population density of less than 500 people per square mile. It is the green towns on the map. That's 170 communities, which makes up 59% of the land area of Massachusetts, but only 13% of the population of Massachusetts. And let me tell you briefly about some demographics, and I'm gonna flip through two, that's two slides from now there. 
I'm going to fly through these, so let me orient you to the map. The blue green, the blue gray color means less than the statewide average. I would call that orange salmon is about the statewide average and the rust color is over the statewide average. And if you look at Franklin County and Berkshire County and out on the Cape, you'll see that population is declining in the most rural areas of Massachusetts. In these same areas, our population is growing older. Median income is higher in Eastern Massachusetts. The communities in Rust have an, a median household income of 88,000. The statewide median income is 68,000. Franklin County is in the unenviable position of for more than three decades have, having the lowest average wage per job of only $37,000. By and large, housing costs are lower in rural Massachusetts, but this is certainly not the case in the Southern Berkshires and the Cape and Islands. Median house price in Massachusetts is about 300,000. Median house price on Nantucket last year was 2.2 million, which is a huge problem for the Cape and Islands. Attracting workforce uh, is, an, is the issue on the Cape and Islands. And while some of our housing is cheaper, when you combine housing and transportation costs, rural costs are higher. Because we have limited public transportation, rural households rely on having vehicles, maintaining and paying for vehicles. A median household income in Berkshire County, 54% of their total income is spent on the total cost of housing and transportation compared to only 38% in Suffolk County. So what did we try to do with the rural plan? We tried to be succinct. It's 100 pages. <laughs> kind of succinct. Um, we tried to identify the assets and challenges in rural Massachusetts. We identified best practices that are occurring in Massachusetts or the country, and then really our focus was to develop action-oriented recommendations that would make changes to policy, to regulation, and to legislation. Our process and timeline, we were challenged by the Legislative Rural Caucus to try to have the plan done for the beginning of this legislative session. We started by holding 10 meetings throughout rural Massachusetts in the winter of 2018 to make sure that we were focusing on the right things. Thanks to contributions from all 13 regional planning agencies and thanks to the legislature and the governor for supporting district local technical assistance, we got funding to create this plan and were able to hire a consultant that helped oversee the creation of the plan. We held 25 stakeholder meetings involving hundreds of stakeholders across all 15 focus areas over the spring and summer to create the plan. We launched it on October 2nd in the State House. I left for vacation on October 3rd. <laughs> so what are some highlights? First, let's quickly address that rural Massachusetts has very strong assets. We have landscapes and that help that encourage outdoor recreation and tourism. And that is true from the Cape and Islands through Western Massachusetts. We are fully participant in the small scale farming and recognizing the value of local food and local beverage product production. We have strong small businesses and strong economic sectors. Hi, Senator Hines. Um, hi, Representative Blay. Come on up. Um, we have strong small businesses and really strong economic sectors, albeit different from the sectors that are important in the 128 and 495 belt. Agriculture, aquaculture, forestry, creative economy, strong in rural Massachusetts. We, because we are small, we are particularly good at problem solving, at innovation, and at collaboration, more so than our suburban and urban counterparts. We have land that acts as the lungs and food basket of Massachusetts, and with careful planning, 
can help with the housing crisis in Massachusetts. Um, I have one minute. Okay, and we have a quality of life that attracts a lot of people. But we, but we also have really serious challenges. Demographic trends, our single biggest challenge, we are have declining population and we're growing older. In Massachusetts, the average percent of people over age 65 is 15.5% of Massachusetts. In Chatham, it's 39.4%. We rely on our road and bridge infrastructure. We do not have public transportation, and yet so many of the state funding formulas are based on population, which means we get less money to maintain our roads and bridges. Our workforce needs are different because we have different economic sectors. The total geography of Berkshire, Franklin, and Hampshire County has two career centers total. That's nearly 2,000 square miles. We have housing issues. We have limited rental housing. We have an older housing stock. And, we, and state and federal housing programs are out of scale with what we can do in rural Massachusetts. Phoebe will talk about education and healthcare since I have about 20 seconds left. But really the other thing that we really lack is the municipal capacity. On average in Massachusetts, state aid makes up 20% of municipal budgets. In Franklin County, because the, tr the form funding formulas are based on population. It's only 16% of our budgets. In Springfield, it's 58% of their budget is funded with state aid. And so, because of that, we rely on local residential property tax, which is limited, which then makes it hard for us to have adequate staffing and to provide adequate salaries. And then that makes it hard for our rural communities to be competitive in state programs and state grants, making this cyclical problem for rural communities. And I could probably stop there, except to say not all rural, rural communities are the same, and we tried to recognize that, th that throughout the creation of the plan, really trying to get recommendations that would help all 170 communities. And then um, the recommendations are really good, and that's what the rest of my slides say. <laughs> if you want to see the recommendations and haven't already, we do have some hard copies, and the entire plan is uh, available digitally online if you go to the www.forcog.org. Um, so I'm here to talk about the public health and health care recommendations, which is the thing that the Public Health Committee is having a hearing about. Um, newly arrived folks, you can get food, it's okay. Um, uh, so what we did, we followed a very similar uh, uh, sort of process that Linda just laid out. We, we had hearings across the state, we met with different stakeholder groups, we gathered all kinds of data, and we came up with a bunch of lists of the challenges that are, that are very familiar to everyone in this room and a bunch of recommendations. So I'm not going to spend a long time on the challenges because literally I am looking at the experts who told me what the challenges were. Um, but uh, they can be summarized as a major shortage of nearly every single kind of healthcare provider. Um, and the fact that, as Linda m noted, we're aging significantly more rapidly than our more urban uh, counterparts. The opioid crisis hitting us worse. While at this point, last year in Franklin County, people overdosed at a higher rate than they did in Boston. Um, so we are not done with that crisis, even as the arc is bending statewide. Um, there's certainly a real challenge for us in terms of our local governmental public health infrastructure, and you'll hear more from me and some of my colleagues on that at a future panel coming up. And then there's the whole challenge we face in terms of emergency uh, medical response, which has a, a many different threads. Um, but is a real crisis in many of rural communities in terms of how long it takes for someone to come to your house when you call 911, what their training is when they get there, how frequently they've done that kind of work, and what that means to your health outcomes. Um, and then uh, lastly, the higher rates of mental health and substance use disorders and sexual and domestic violence uh, uh, assaults that we see in rural communities. So that's sort of the summary of the challenges that you're all working with. And then moving on to our... Uh, just to give you a sense of how that 
bundles up. This is the rural death rate uh, and the percent to which it exceeds the urban death rate for different things in New England. Um, so that's sort of the summary of all of the, the, out, the outcome of all of those different factors playing together. Go ahead. Okay, so we made a couple uh, bundles of recommendations. Knowing many of you are here to speak to that, I am not going to read these, and also I don't believe in reading slides, but essentially we looked at a set of existing, regula of existing legislation that we hope will pass in this session. Um, and these run the gamut from sort of scope of practice types of legislation to changing uh, things with um, rules around ambulance and uh, also passing the, um, what's it called, State <laughs> passing the um, safe bill to create a much improved local public health infrastructure. So we've got a, a bunch of legislation we'd like to see passed in this session. And we'd like to see a lot of things funded, unsurprisingly. Um, and so that's the second category of things we asked for. Um, hopefully at least 50 of you got a copy of all the recommendations chapter when you walked in. Um, and I can make more after I'm done talking. Uh, so that includes, as you can see, a bunch of different things many of you are here to talk to, but essentially look at the things that are missing in rural communities uh, because their state funding has ended or because they never had any. Um, or things that are working really well but could stand to be implemented broadly across Massachusetts and rural communities. So that's also a section of the report, which I won't get into, but you can see when you read it. Okay. Um, and then we had a list of other recommendations, so that are not necessarily about legislation that needs to be passed or funding that needs to be had. And those, again, look at how are we going to get a more robust public health workforce here? And, and that can be everything from doctors to nurses to community health workers to phlebotomists to you, you name it. We have a hard time for folks here going to get that training and uh, f folks from here and attracting folks from outside of here uh, to rural communities to do that work. So there are a number of recommendations that focus on changing that dynamic. Um, and in particular, a bunch of other ways to support the incredibly fragile the public health infrastructure we have here and healthcare infrastructure, including our community health centers. Um, there's, as I already mentioned, there's this thing called DPH, uh, DPH's Community Paramedicine Project, which is a way that um, public health services could maybe be augmented through ambulance services, but it's quite expensive and hard, to, um, hard for rural communities to access that. And then there's some great work being done around the state. Um, locally, I'm thinking of Deerfield doing some age-friendly planning around how do we actually turn this from uh, something we're worried about, the age-friendly, you know, the sort of pro progression of our aging community to a real asset. And how do we make our communities better for everybody by making them better for older folks? Um, and that is work that there is state funding out there to do under the Community Compact, and we'd like to see more people doing that work, more communities doing that. And then the last one is really the over the overall. Oh, that was strange. All of my slides again. Okay. Well, anyway, what I was going to say was the very last um, recommendation on that list was essentially asking. This one's complicated. It's not something that you legislators can necessarily fix, but it is when systems are being set up at the state in order to offer funding, offer licensure, offer training. Think about how hard it is for people to get to these meetings. Consider having lower numbers be an acceptable number of people before the Ethics Commission will come out and do a training for us. Well, if you don't have 30 people, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to hold the training. Well, I can't necessarily get 30 people on a weeknight because everyone here is on five boards and lives, you know, 50 miles away. Um, so that sort of flexibility we'd like to pursue with uh, um, funding and training infrastructure at the state. Um, so that's the last of the recommendations. And I think we want to just now start hearing from the actual people in the room who helped us create these recommendations. That's great. Thanks. Thanks so much. Phoebe and Linda, thank you. Um, so this rural policy plan, you'll, we were only able to give you just a tiny little snapshot. It is a Herculean effort. And you have done us unbelievable, unbelievable um, benefit by giving birth to it. And I just want to formally welcome Senator Adam Hines, Representative Natalie Blay. Um, you know, we shouted out to you before we started, but let me just say that Senator Hines, Rep Blay, Rep Mark, along with Linda and Phoebe, 
and the other members of the Rural Policy Commission, they are leading the way for our rural towns, and I'm just, I'm glad to put my shoulder to their wheel and give it a good shove with them, really, so happy. Um, so we're gonna look first at disparities, um, because we wanna set the stage. Um, so we're gonna have two panels. Um, the first panel is Claire Higgins, uh, Dr. Keenan Harib, Heather Bialecki Canning, Ilana Steinhauer, and Cheryl Dukes. Please welcome them up. And, and as they're coming up, let me just say hello to the folks who are watching from the State House. You are warmly welcome. Um, we are live streaming this. Um, so, um, so you'll see people maybe engaging over Twitter or on Facebook. Uh, and just a reminder, um, our panelists will speak for four minutes, and then we will open it first to questions from legislators and uh, public health staff. And then, as time permits, I want you all to engage. So um, Claire, do you want to go first? Okay. Oh, and she just dropped her note, so it's perfect timing. Okay, here we go. Oh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm coming from a forum that we held this morning at Franklin County Resource Network's Legislative Breakfast where we talked about housing and homelessness. So there's a direct connection with what's going on here now and what we talked about this morning. And I'm going to talk, I'm, I'm not going to talk about disparities in terms of health per se, but I'm going to talk about some disparities that lead to challenges to have healthy communities. So um, I think I have three slides. I think we were all told we could have three slides, right? We're, we're the dictatorship of the slides. So this is fuzzy, but what I want, and I hope you can see it, but this is, comes from the Housing and Transportation Index, which is a really fascinating uh, analysis of looking at housing costs and transportation costs together that Linda referenced earlier. This is for Franklin County. And in Franklin County compared to Suffolk County, a moderate, a, a, a moderate income person would spend 64% of their income on housing plus transportation costs versus Suffolk County where it would be 45% on housing plus transportation costs. Now this index has last been updated in 2017, so it hasn't, they're not keeping it, it up to date and I feel like this is one of the outcomes that I'd like to see as us push to get, keep, this, keep this current because it's a very telling index. So, but what does that say? If you're spending that much money on just your housing and transportation, what's left? Then you're really trying to parse out what, whatever dollars you have left in, in your wage that is the lowest um, average annual wage in the, in the Commonwealth, right? And in the four Western counties, uh, we have four of the six uh, poorest co counties in the Commonwealth, right? So um, Hampshire, Franklin, uh, Berkshire, and, and Suffolk, and Hamden, sorry are in the bottom six, along with uh, Bristol. So another very, has some very rural parts of their county too. So, so this kind of analysis is really important as we think about how does the state allocate money for transportation? How are we thinking about transportation as a baseline for people to get access to everything they need? And I wanna flip that too, because if people have to drive everywhere to get their services, right, that, that may, that's an additional cost, right? So when the state does formulas for funding agencies like mine, could they instead fund us adequately so we can drive to the people that need the services as opposed to making people drive to us? There was just a, an, it, uh, the auditor just did a study of the WIC program that showed that there's a uh, part of the state where it takes, um, that everybody's at least 20 miles from a WIC office. Back in the day, WIC used to have little WIC mobiles that could drive around and go to the clients. They don't fund that anymore, right? So it's that kind of thinking that we need change about. Can you change our formulas so that we can actually get to the people we need to get to? Okay, uh, slide two. What is the effect of that in terms of actual, uh, let's look at, look at slices a little different way. Public transportation in, um, in Franklin County, um, in Franklin County, less, a very small amount of people that use actually over 4% use public transportation. And you see where they are down here? They're in South County really where, where uh, they're right by UMass where that, the bus service extends to, right? If you go north, it's a very low number that are actually using transport, much lower number that are using public transportation. Look at Suffolk County. Look at the access to public transportation out there, right? All that purple. That's people taking public transportation to work. That has two effects, though, because I, so I want to go to the next slide. 
because it actually has some public and health implications there too. It, it has, it has um, uh, how, much, how, many, how many greenhouse gases are put into the atmosphere, right? So we are putting more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere almost twice as much as hap is happening when you have you, more ubiquitous public transportation that is more carbon neutral. So there's a, a public health implication there as well. So, and my time is done. Somebody held up a stop sign. <laughs> So the trick to overcoming that the slide dictatorship is to actually sit and slide on three. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm really what I'm pressed by is how we all seem to be reaching the same conclusion. Uh, some of us have talked to each other, but but what's really important here is that these conclusions make sense uh, for someone who's been in, living in the rural community. They understand the challenges here. Um, I want to add to some of the information that you already got uh, from a medical perspective. And, and, and the slide will speak for themselves. I'm not going to read the slides uh, uh, as much as just give you the highlights here. We, we have a very small percentage of patients, 5%, who account for 50% of the cost of healthcare. And, and this is a much bigger problem in the rural parts of the state, and mainly because patients are older, they have chronic diseases that don't get attended to, they, have, don't, they don't have access to healthcare. Healthcare is much more expensive in rural states. Out-of-pocket expenses are about $1,000 extra for somebody who lives in, in the rural part of the state and in, a, in communities where their income levels are much lower than urban states. So you can imagine the impact plus the transportation costs that we talked about. So that increases poverty. That increases access to food uh, uh, problems. They, so this is compounding. From my perspective as a as a provider, my responsibility is figure out, figuring out how we provide access to this very challenging community. This is not unique to Franklin County in the sense that most parts of the United States, rural parts of the United States, have similar issues. Um, there are, however, models that have been tested, not only here, but in other places, the CHART uh, project that uh, Cheryl, Cheryl Pascucci was in charge of. It basically uh, founded on an outreach program. It, it's actually making patients um, more comfortable talking about their health care with someone before they get to the emergency room. Once they get to the emergency room, to help them through the process of their care in the outpatient setting so they don't have to come back, especially when they don't have access to a primary care provider. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, at the, yeah, see how I can do this? <laughs> uh, there are many reasons why people uh, become unhealthy. Uh, and, and this is just, again, this is data from uh, Massachusetts where uh, we know that 60% of Massachusetts adults uh, are overweight and obese. That, that contributes to uh, several health issues. Cancer is a leading cause of death. We know that smoking is a, is a bad thing for uh, people, and they die from it as a result. There are uh, cancers of all types uh, are higher in minorities, mainly because maybe some genetics, but mainly because of in, in access to health care. These are the inequities and, and disparities of health care. How do we provide access to people who... Uh, don't really have very good contact with the primary care providers. Uh, and so that's really important. The, 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 the slides at the bottom, because everybody was using maps, I, I decided to use one. The, the, the colors are interesting because the darker color is a, a worse outcome of healthcare. This is in Massachusetts, the white um, implies that it's a better outcome of health. So when you look at these counties, they're very close to each other and you can see the disparities in healthcare outcomes, okay? And I want to show you the next slide. And again, look how, how, how I, so learn from this. So, <laughs> no, number two, can anybody read that slide, number two? We're, okay, we, we are actually one of the wealthiest states in the union. Okay, so, and, and we generally, when you measure the average of healthcare outcomes, we're, set, we're ranked second. It doesn't feel that way when you live in these counties. Okay, so for a, the fifth richest state in the union to have such bad problems in rural uh, state is a, is a really not fair to, to, uh, to, to people who expect us to do better. Um, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> Thank you. I do not have slides, I have a story to share. 
um, mostly because I'm not a doctor and could not fit what I'm about to say in three slides. So nice job. <laughs> Um, so I'm Heather Bielecki Canning. I'm the executive director of the North Quabbin Community Coalition. And I need to start by saying a huge thank you to all um, emergency medical services that are working around the clock right now and National Grid and all those folks that are helping to restore power in North Quabbin. As of this morning, six of our nine towns that we serve still did not have power. But what we did have was people stepping up and working together and cutting trees out of roads and making sure that their neighbors and the elderly folks around them were being taken care of. So as much as I am gonna talk about disparities, don't worry. Um, I really wanted to talk about the strengths and the pioneering spirit that happened. So if I can make one recommendation that, that is a takeaway from today, it's to listen to the constituents because they know what works for their communities and much of those things are homegrown solutions about taking care of our own. Um, that being said, I want to uh, tell you a story. Um, so there is a young mom that I know. She has a school-aged um, child and a toddler. And her story is not all that different than ones we hear all the time, but she was willing to give me permission to tell it. <laughs> she um, does not have a car of her own. She has uh, an apartment that she is able to maintain thanks to a voucher that she gets from housing. Um, she does not qualify for um, child care voucher because of um, multiple things in her situation. And she does work right now. She has a job at Market Basket in Athol, and yay, we have a Market Basket in Athol. <laughs> Our rising retail establishment, um, which unfortunately does not pay very well. A lot of those positions which we desperately need filled do not fulfill living wage meaningful employment that so many people deserve. Um, but she is grateful to have a job. She was formerly incarcerated for substance use and has um, been a frequent user of our North Quabbin Recovery Center. And her job allows her to have time during the week to do the things that she needs to do for her recovery. That being said, she also needs to work nights and weekends to help maintain her living situation. We do not have transportation that runs nights and weekends. And um, so we have people that do what's right. So there was a woman who was previously an outreach nurse for uh, Haywood Medical Group. She no longer works for that organization. Um, she took it upon herself when she found out that the one barrier to this woman receiving meaningful um, living wages every week was getting to work on Sundays because Sundays in a retail establishment like that offers time and a half. So for her, working a Sunday made the huge difference between being able to maintain her quality of life and her children and her access to recovery support. Um, so she did it. The nurse stepped up and drove her every single Sunday so that she could have time and a half. Oh, that's really, sorry. One minute. <laughs> um, so as much as there are multiple disparities you heard about in the story I just told you, which was access to recovery supports that only happen during the week, access to transportation, um, and access to just quality of life when you're trying to just make ends meet. All of these things are not um, only here in rural America, but they are definitely felt stronger. So her need for family support to watch her children on nights and weekends, her need for an infrastructure around her happens informally. And I think as a state, we could do so much better to support those around her and her to improve the quality of life for everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you to the Rural Health Policy Committee and the representatives. My name is Alana Steinhauer. I'm a nurse practitioner and the executive director of Volunteers in Medicine Berkshires. Then Berkshires was established in 2004. It's a volunteer-based medical and dental facility that provides care for over 1,000 patients per year who are without medical and or dental insurance for free. With a staff of 10, but a volunteer roster of 60 clinical providers, we provide full internal medical services, restorative dinner, dental, behavioral health, integrative pain management, nutrition, optometry, and a full case management and social determinants of health program. My focus for the next few minutes is the rural health policy as it relates to undocumented immigrant community in rural Massachusetts. Despite the declining population in Berkshire County, a large study done by Berkshire DeConnick showed the immigrant population is the only growing population. 
This is consistent with our trend that has shown a 50% increase in patient numbers over the past three years. Analysis of our data shows that this increase of patient includes a client population who are predominantly Hispanic, recent to this country, are working age, and generally have lower educational achievement compared to their peers. For the undocumented immigrants living in rural Massachusetts, their health is impacted by all of the factors identified in the report. There are some unique factors, however, that are important to consider. I've outlined them on a piece of paper in front of you. I do want to highlight, however, that undocumented immigrants 18 and over do not qualify for, for health insurance in this state. Let's jump right into policy proposal recommendations. I'm extremely impressed with the rural policy proposal. Um, I just want to comment on three quick things, which are numbers 1B, 2B, and 6. I know you've memorized them. First, <laughs> allowing providers to practice to their full scope of is imperative. Um, it will increase access and improve quality of care. Second, broad-based community coalitions are important and effective. However, funding has to big, be big enough to allow for the representatives from the CBOs to actively engage. Finally, I think that the critical access designation is good. However, it must be implemented with a model of prevention rather than the traditional fee-for-service model it is now based on. I'll now go into some additional recommendations related to undocumented immigrants. I have eight. I'll just go through a few. The rest are on your paper. The first, state investment needs to focus on expansion of proven local models that are already working in our own rural communities. Funding opportunities usually require new programs. This creates a huge burden and often unnecessary shifts in focus for smaller agencies and can ultimately lead to worse outcomes. Second, Create a pool of funding that would be available as needs are identified by local agencies. Organizations such as VIM need to be able to quickly assess needs and respond in informed ways based on our specific clients. For example, after the most recent presidential election, our no-show rate show started to increase. A data collection revealed fear of driving as the number one reason. So we created a volunteer-based drivers program. We now provide over 850 free rides per year and experience less than a 5% no-show rate. This program, however, requires an increase in funding. Third, invest in alternative types of care. Rural areas such as the Berkshires have untapped resources with our second home and retired populations. Models such as VIM utilize this resource, making the Berkshires more attractive for professionals retiring while providing free services for the uninsured. Investment in organizations such as VIM could be done in two ways. One, invest in operating. With VIM as an example, an investment in our operating budget would result in a two-to-one return on investment just by decreasing ED rates and hospitalizations. Second, make volunteering easier for professionals. Pass legislation that makes obtaining licensing from out of state easier and waive licensing costs to professionals that are only volunteering. Fourth, as you know, best of practice, I would recommend increasing funding for CHWs. An increase in funding would not only increase connection of immigrants to agencies, but also expose gaps within our area and help identify needed policy changes. CHWs are also key to trust. Finally, because it looks like I have 10 seconds, increase funding for interpreting services. How can you do any of this without interpreting services? Help support legislation for driver's license and ensure MassHealth Limited health safety net funds are fully funded. Thank you. I mean, this is, is it, can you hear me? No. Um, I just want to really recognize the incredible, incredible uh, passion uh, and goodwill that all of the panel today are going to share with us. Okay, we have Cheryl Duke. Make this work. Hello, hello. Cheryl L. Dukes was invited to be here today. It, she is present. She is just not here. Could we all look around the room, please, to see who is in the room? Please. We have the Rural Policy Plan in our hands. And we had an introductory slideshow that demonstrated, among other things, the people who live in our rural areas. Of all of the slides, I believe I counted three people of color. How many people are in this room? I was invited, 
I was invited, Beth was invited, to be here with you today because Cheryl L. Dukes does not speak to groups of people, people who are white, about communities of color. With four minutes, three slides, and unlimited written testimony. Sam, could you go to the Baldwin slide, please? The reason why Charlotte L. Dukes does not do that is because race is a social and a structural concept created by white men, historically, who owned land. This construct continues to exist into the present because we permit it and allow it to continue to exist. In order to have people of color, non-white people, which is already inequitable, unequal, and intentional, intentional, that means that we who are white get to decide who tells the story. Can we have the Commonwealth slide, please? This slide tells us the story of whiteness in New England and Massachusetts. There are some cultures that believe that we die three times. The first time is when we die. The second time is when we are put into the ground and are lo no longer. The third time is when no one remembers our name. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, our indigenous native people, while they seem not to be present here and seem never to be invited to these sorts of conversations, will live on in perpetuity because Massachusetts is the name of an indigenous group of people. We do see, however, above the whole human person that is present in our great seal, a disembodied arm holding a weapon. What this slide demonstrates is that the social determinants of health based upon our white supremacy, domination, power, and culture actually works the way that it was intended. Can we have the last slide, please, from Bell Hooks? Charlotte Dukes was invited today to speak about, and time is a social construct, so I'll just finish what I have to say. She was invited to speak about what more can and should we be doing to improve health care for people of color in rural communities. What lens should we be using when forming programs and policy? How can we expand upon and or transform the work being done to bring culturally informed means of care to rural areas? We are here, we have always been here. Cheryl L. Dukes, when she was first invited to participate on this panel, told the senator, who she's very grateful for inviting her to come to this panel, that she does not do that. Cheryl L. Dukes does not talk about communities of color because race is a social construct created by white people, which creates the inequitable 
health disparities. And we are not talking about health care. We are talking about medical care, which is different. And because I'm not finished, and time is a social construct as well, because Cheryl L. Dukes was very clear about not speaking to people about communities of color because race is a social construct, she invited Beth to come and speak on her behalf because she was really clear about what she does and what she does not do. And her question was and remains, what difference does it make if Cheryl L. Dukes or any other quote unquote non-white person of color, who by the way includes all communities and varieties of people, substance use disorder people, veterans, women, poor people, wealthy people, all people. So Cheryl L. Duke is very clear about not speaking for communities of color and then is asked to speak for communities of color, what difference does it make whether she chooses to participate in a very important panel or not? Death is with us always. When we are not seen, when we are not heard, do we actually exist? Cheryl L. Dukes was not invited to be on this panel because of who she is or what she brings to the conversation. Cheryl L. Dukes was invited to this panel because she is a Negro. She is a Negro.
because when I was a selectman of Buckland, I was not representing communities of color. I was representing all of us. And we know that race is a social construct and a structural construct because when was the last time a white man with a tan was killed in assault of bullets because a police officer did not recognize his wallet wasn't a cell phone, was mistaken for a gun? I'm now stopping. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. The deep complexities in this work. So thank you, thank you to you all. I'm going to open it up for a few questions from legislators and staff, and then, of course, to the public. Any questions for this esteemed panel? some out-of-pocket expense when we see a physician, whether it's a co-payment of some kind of, or deductible. Um, but because the insurance uh, uh, market is, is a little different also in, in, in the rural part of the state in what uh, uh, they, they have a additional out-of-pocket expenses above and beyond what the insurances can cover, number one. The second thing is because uh, many patients don't reach a physician or a provider, whether it's a nurse practitioner, until it is they have an advanced condition of diabetes or something else, their cost increases significantly because now instead of being maybe diet controlled diabetes, now they have to be on a medication with a higher copayment. So uh, as a result, you have an, an older population, you have a uh, much more severe disease when they present for the first time to a provider. Sometimes they present in the emergency room for the first time and, and the cost of an emergency room visit is six times higher than a visit to a primary care physician's office. And often that they have to pay a significant portion of that as well. And the reason they go to the emergency room is because they can't see a primary care provider. I just I wanted to add to that because absolutely that's what we're we're seeing locally. And one of the other things that happens is just the logistics about someone accessing primary care versus specialty care because there is such a, such a shortage. And Phoebe alluded to this earlier of primary care physicians, specialty care isn't even on our radar. We're trying just to have primary care be available. Um, and without things like parity with telehealth and the ability to make sure that specialty care is accessible in rural regions, not only is it much harder to access those things, but you're taking a whole day off work just to travel wherever they are, yet alone any other 
logistical nightmare things that come into play with that. So the cost is just exponentially more than just that out-of-pocket expense and the insurance bill at the time. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you all for giving us the tools that we need as legislators to do our job better. Uh, it's not only the, what is the website, Claire? Um, housing plus transportation. Housing plus transportation. I was giving a presentation. Can you use the mic? No, I'm not trying to use the mic. Yes, sorry. We're having some technical difficulties. So by giving us tools like the websites you provided, I gave a presentation to some folks in Boston about what it meant for rural Massachusetts when we talk about transportation and housing. I used that tool there. Um, I want to thank you for the policy recommendations for the budget requests because that gives us real things to work from and the stories and certainly the perspectives that everyone brings to this conversation. It gives us what we need to do what we do in Boston and to better advocate for rural communities. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and let me just say, Cheryl uh, Death, um, you raised the state seal. And so it's not directly related to healthcare, and yet it is, uh, thanks to you. You brought it into the room, right? Um, and so there is a bill to change the state seal of the Commonwealth. It is, I, I believe it is egregious. It's been filed for 30 plus years, and this is the year we have to get it done, 2020. So there is a bill, certainly will make information available. You are right to call it out as a symbol that should be abolished and rethought. Um, I also wanted to say, Ilana, you spoke about people being able to practice, immigrants being able to practice at the top of their license and capabilities. I totally agree, right, an immigrant workforce. And there is a bill that just was reported out of labor and workforce development. Uh, Representative Mindy, Mindy Dom and I have it. It's a great and bold and pretty audacious bill um, that would really change the way that we look at licensure in the Commonwealth and break down real barriers to people, especially healthcare, looking at healthcare, but not only healthcare, um, break down barriers and the ways we welcome immigrants, new workers to this Commonwealth. It is essential. It's, you know, I think the way we do it is um, based in xenophobia, fear, and all of those social constructs that keep us apart from each other, this would actually really open it up and say, no, when you come to this community, should you choose to settle in the Commonwealth, we welcome you, and here are all the ways that we're going to make it easy for you to thrive here. Uh, so that bill will need advocacy. It's only one step on its journey being reported out of committee. Um, we're going to need really this kind of people power in Western Massachusetts to make it happen. Um, so I want to thank the panel, and we're going to move on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, the second panel is uh, is part two on this. Um, it's an important conversation. Uh, join me in welcoming Kat Allen, Deborah McLaughlin, Ed Sayre, Peg McDonough, McDonough, excuse me, and Linda Siraj, please. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Is the microphone working? Um, thank you so much for being here and for listening and for folks that are listening in from Boston. Thank you for being here to support rural health and listen. Um, I am uh, going to speak also to one of um, Franklin County's strengths and rural community strengths. We've heard already about the strength of collaboration. Um, my name is Kat Allen, and um, I am one of the co-coordinators of the Communities That Care Coalition of Franklin County and the North Quabbin. <laughs> <Rock stars. laughs> uh, it is a, a coalition that has been operating for 17 years um, to improve the health and well-being of young people in the region and to reduce substance use as well as increase, um, decrease health disparities, increase nutrition and physical activity. Um, so I'm glad to be able to speak about our work in preventing um, youth substance use in particular today and also just this is a really important time in terms of 
you know, between the opioid crisis, marijuana legalization, and the vaping epidemic, this is an essential time for us to be focusing on and taking action to give our young people the supports that they need to make healthy decisions. Um, so the, actually above us is a photo of the Communities That Care Coalition. We follow um, a system called the Communities That Care System nationally. This is an evidence-based program that was developed by researchers in Seattle that has been shown to be effective in reducing youth substance use and reducing youth violence, has a six to one return on investment, has been studied for more than 30 years, is listed in the National Registry of Effective Policies and Programs, and in the Surgeon General's Report on Addiction. In general, we know that community coalitions are effective at reducing youth substance use. This is an approach that works. As Heather said before, the solutions exist in communities. We have the solutions and, and letting communities drive this is really, um, has shown to be very effective. So we followed here locally, we followed the National Communities That Care process. We formed a coalition. We conducted a teen health survey, which we've repeated every year for the last 17 years in the schools, all of those schools. Um, we've formed a series of work groups, including now a new racial justice work group. We selected evidence-based strategies that were aimed at our priority risk and protective factors based on our local data. So local data, national research, we selected these strategies, um, and then we institutionalize these strategies. And I think um, the next slide shows some of the strategies that we have. Um, oh boy, I thought they were gonna come up one by one. But in any case, <laughs> we have just in case, uh, implemented the life skills curriculum with all of the public schools in the region. All of the middle schools are doing that evidence-based program. We've worked with many different community agencies who are now doing evidence-based parenting programs. We worked with schools and town governments to get policies um, that are most effective in reducing youth substance use and improving health. We have done um, social norms marketing and social marketing campaigns that target parents, that target students. We have events and outreach to parents and young people. And it's a whole variety of programs and practices implemented by a whole range of different institutions in the community. So the next slide shows some of our results. We've seen dramatic decreases in substance use across the region. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, thank you. And I do want to say that these um, decreases are far greater than the dec decreases that we've seen across the U.S. and across the state. And that when we look and we look at disparities, the disparities are decreasing as well by race and ethnicity, by LGBTQ youth, by income. So this is really helping to reduce disparities as well. BSAS, the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services, has a $240 million budget, of which $8 million goes to prevention. Massachusetts is one of only six states that doesn't put any of its own state money into prevention, only federal funding. And um, we only spend the minimum required by the federal government, 20% of a federal block grant. So Massachusetts, we, we know we can't treat our way out of the opioid epidemic or the vaping epidemic or whatever comes next. And we know that prevention works, that community-based primary prevention works. So it's time for Massachusetts to invest in prevention. We have a responsibility to our young people to not just keep putting Band-Aids on the problem or looking at the other way when we are sitting on the, a cure. So um, I, I just wanna encourage us to really think about um, the Medicaid waiver that currently covers services. Um, the new Medicaid waiver will cover ser services that are currently covered by um, the block grant. And now is a really good time to look at increasing the amount of the block grant that goes for prevention. And I went over my time, I apologize. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Deb McLaughlin. I'm the coordinator of the Opioid Task Force of Franklin County and the North Coven region. And thank you for uh, having me here today. I wanna to give a shout out to the OTF co-chairs. We've got DA Sullivan in the back of the room. Thank you, DA. Uh, Registered John Merrigan was also here earlier. 
um, and Sheriff Donnellan. Without their leadership, uh, our task force would not be as powerful and effective as it is. So um, obviously, I, I always like to share this little slide around just the scale of what we're trying to deal with here in our in Western Mass, but you obviously know this well. So we'll just go ahead to the next slide. Um, so I just want to ask, how many of us in the room know someone, aside from our professional life, that's really struggling or been impacted by substance use or opioid use disorder, just by a show of hands? So this is nearly everyone in the room, um, which really reflects the kind of statistics that are up here on the left-hand side of the slide, where we have millions of people impacted by this, as well as millions of people who are in recovery. Um, but we still have a, a deadly problem where too many people are dying each day from opioid uh, overdoses. And you can see on the right-hand side with data from the DPH department and also from our DA's office, we had a record number of overdose fatalities last year compared to the year before. So we still have quite a problem on our hands. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to address my brief comments on today was sort of the intersection, the inter how inter the intersection of, of public health, community health, uh, kind of overlays with this relationship to recovery. So we had John Kelly out here recently. He's a fabulous kind of researcher and director of the Recovery Research Institute. I would certainly recommend him highly to any member of our legislative delegation. Um, as an expert looking at um, what is needed for recovery. And as you look at these various stages um, and, and how often relapse can happen as part of this disease, um, and, and how when people can take up to five times multiple attempts over years worth of, um, to make this transition happen, they still need housing, they still need food, they still need health care, they still need daycare for their children, they still need meaningful jobs all of those things. And what the science is telling us about what is needed to actually support someone in a healthy pathway to recovery doesn't line up with how we insurance, how insurance reimburses services, uh, how long treatment uh, uh, can last, uh, how much the insurance will pay for treatment and recovery services and so forth. And then when you couple that with the inability of us to actually provide a life-saving treatment like MAT, uh, like methadone, we have significant methadone deserts in Franklin County, North Quabbin region. The current methadone provider has been closed to new patients for almost a year now. Um, there isn't any um, services in the North Quabbin area at all. So you have people just don't have access to these this life-saving uh, medication. So what I would urge the panel to consider uh, as, as we all look at how we can be supportive uh, to implement these recommendations of the Rural Health Policy uh, Commission, thank you, um, to really uh, better assess an, an, the alignment of insurance, regulatory, and other systems that are informed by science that actually can dictate how services can be implemented and, and funded. Um, how can we also examine more closely those insurance and regulatory barriers that actually prevent people from getting access to care? And how can we better support this community-based system of navigators? Um, uh, Dr. Keenan talked earlier about the great work that Cheryl and others have done around the CHART program. That made a huge difference in the number of emergency room visits. It saved a lot of money because someone was there as a caring person in the community who knew that person in their community, created a plan that was going to help them navigate all these multiple systems. Um, so we can uh, provide some more specific recommendations offline. But thank you again for this opportunity. And thank you so much to our legislative delegation for the support of the Opioid Task Force work. We deeply are grateful for your help and support. Thank you. Well, it's interesting, you know, when I when I read the the, uh, the public health document, I, I was really, um, you know, it's interesting to think about how terrible it may be to live in rural in rural places. Um, lower tax dollars, suicide, depression, uh, domestic violence, racism, and so on. And I think that in some ways we underestimate some of the values and things that we really can offer in rural uh, rural areas, particularly some of the coalition building and things like that. There's a lot of wonderful things that I think we should really be spending some time uh, and energy focusing on rather than some of the areas where we, we, we need some extra help. Um, and, you know, just a shout out to our urban friends. I mean, sort of the toxic effects of, um, you know, sexism, racism, and, uh, you know, economic disparity, I think, really weigh on, on people in every area, not just in rural areas. However, um, there are some, some issues that are specifically 
problematic in the in the rural areas. And uh, for example, there are definitely fewer healthcare professionals in hospitals. But you kind of expect that since there are fewer people to take care of, and that's one of the reasons why I think the cost is higher because you have, you know, fewer fewer people to take care of, but you have essentially sort of the same overhead in some ways. I think this can be addressed by allowing nurse practitioners to um, to practice at the top of their license, which has been a bill in the legislature for a long time, and I think really needs to be passed. And it's also because there are fewer providers here, it's really critically important to attract and reach, retain healthcare staff. And so I think here, you know, fully funding a rural health uh, student loan forgive, forgive, forgiveness program would really go a long way towards having an impact in that area. And also for allowing waivers and exceptions for programs to train the healthcare workforce of tomorrow to encourage um, clinicians to locate in rural areas. And, you know, with respect to this uh, latter point, I was really disappointed recently to see that Bay State's um, upcoming family residency program did not receive some additional funding to train residents in specific Western Mass federally funded um, qualified health centers. It's a very short-sighted uh, decision, an incorrect decision in my opinion. Um, in addition to that, I think that telehealth will be also very important for rural areas, both by shortening drive times to, um, to primary care clinicians and also by making access to specialists more available to the primary care providers themselves. So I think um, whatever can be done in terms of telehealth will actually be quite important. Um, one of the things that we are particularly passionate about in, uh, in the community health center is oral health care. And I think that we've made a really big commitment to uh, abating the impact of poor, um, poor health care in sort of the thinly dispersed rural population that we have here by essentially concentrating um, oral health care services on the campus of Bay State Franklin Medical Center with their uh, amazing partnership for the past three years. Our facility there um, has really been open five days a week, but we are, we are working very hard to make it open seven days a week, 12 hours a day. And the uh, demand for oral health care services is really almost insatiable. It's, it's amazing how much the demand is for it. So I think that that will be happening in the next, uh, in the next few months. A large majority of our oral health patients are uh, underinsured or they have Medicaid um, conditions that are you know, not replicated in, uh, with other community providers in the private practice realm. And I think that this latter point you know, reprises something that I said earlier, that people of means always find a way to get the service you know, no matter um, where they live. I mean, even if you look in, in Western Mass, if you look at the um, uh, longevity, oop, stop, boy, that's, that's not good. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's, I, I, I really think that, um, you know, it's really a combination of building on some of the capacity that we have in rural, in rural areas and also trying to fund um, additional healthcare support services. So, yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Peg McDonough, and I'm the age-friendly coordinator for Berkshire County. And I'm pleased to be here today. It's nice to see everyone. Thank you, Senator Comerford. And hi, Adam. How are you? <laughs> That's right. Uh, we are uh, in the midst of impl implementing an action plan to create a more livable Berkshire County for people of all ages, but really with a focus on the needs of an aging population. Uh, we are the second oldest county in the state after Cape Cod, and uh, we operate under the theory that every young person will soon be an old person, so we really do work for everyone. Um, we are, uh, now that we're actually implementing our action plan, we are now running into the roadblocks and the obstacles that seemingly have prevented our doing some of the things we're trying to do earlier. Um, of course, we have the challenge that has been outlined by everybody here so far that we are um, a community of 32 municipalities over 950 square miles. We have um, insufficient communications technology. Remember dial-up? It lives in Berkshire County. Um, we are uh, very aware of uh, distances and the, the need for transportation, I can say honestly, comes up in every single conversation we have. Uh, in some form or another. Uh, access to health care is a concern because as you've seen, our disparities are quite great. Uh, as a second home community, we have a lot of uh, you know, economic disparities and um, 
a real kind of cultural shift between North and South County that um, is, is now proving difficult to kind of even explain to people, but also to get people engaged in what we're trying to do and the urgency of it. Um, we are fortunate in that we are utilizing the collective impact model that is actually helping us realize that there are many actors across our, con uh, our county uh, working in partnership with us, but kind of doing their own thing. And we, we manage, we've learned to juggle and we learn to talk to people on the fly. How are you doing? Do you need our help? What's happening? Uh, we also do uh, run community meetings um, at the local level. And honestly, when I start to explain what Age Friendly Berkshire is about, when the heads begin to nod, I know I have them. And it becomes much easier to get in front of our uh, select board leadership to say, you know, this is how this can happen in this community. We'll help you get there. Um, I, I saw in the, uh, the plan about how to make it happen on the local level, and one of the items uh, that I saw is that the community compact, which does include age-friendly planning in it, I would aver that using an attitude of age-friendly in all things is a better way around because then you don't have to focus on just one thing in the compact. It can literally be worked into pretty much anything you're doing. So um, I think that moving forward as we start to drill down on transportation, for example, allowing human service and paratransit providers to drive more people who may not have be affected by those same things is, is uh, a challenge because there may some, be some legislative impediments to their being able to just pick anybody up. Like veterans are supposed to transport veterans, but if they're only running a half bus, wouldn't it be great to put a few more people on it? Uh, we're finding that we can't just start doing that. We have to get permission. So when you do start implementing, uh, call us. We'll, we, <laughs> we can help. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm Linda Siraj, and I've been asked to speak about uh, recovery coaching. I can't even believe that I've been asked to speak about recovery coaching. I am like, um, you know, I, five years ago, we didn't even know what a recovery coach was, and here I, we are on this panel. Um, I'm very, very um, thankful and grateful, and I appreciate the recognition for recovery coaching. So... Um, I've been asked to talk about recovery coaching, how they're trained, how they're deployed, how they're supported in Massachusetts, and in four minutes, I'm just going to tell you a couple things, all right? <laughs> okay. I think this slide, okay, is, um, you know, we take a look at role clarity, you know, what is a recovery coach? Everybody wants one, but nobody knows for sure what they are. And so when we think about recovery coaching, you know, we often have ideas in our head about other peer roles we know about. We know about navigators. We know about community health workers. And the role of a recovery coach is a real specific model. The training of the model was developed by CCAR, Connecticut Community for Addiction Recovery. It's the one adopted in Massachusetts as the required training for recovery coaches in Massachusetts. And it begins with a five-day fundamental training in recovery, co in recovery principles, fundamentals, coaching, skills, um, a knowledge base. Um, and then recovery coaches go on to take an ethics training. There's a three-day ethics training that's involved. And um, then they can, you know, they're often hired or do some volunteer work as a recovery coach where they get some practice that we really hope is well-supervised and um, have that, live, that experience as they work towards possibly their certification in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, recovery coaches are required to have 60 hours of training and 500 hours of supervised recovery coach experience. Um, and there's some other requirements that are sometimes a barrier and obstacle to people getting certified in Massachusetts. So we really want to make sure that we're not raising the bar so high now that we are eliminating people who might have that exact lived experience that will so well serve the people they're working with. Okay, so um, so so there's there's some idea about trainings. We need we need um, we know that training opportunities in rural Massachusetts are limited. The Bureau of Substance Abuse Services provides training in Springfield, Northampton, or Pittsfield because you know that's where the people are. And um, so I want to talk about a couple of models that have been 
Oh my goodness, one minute. Couple models that have been worked on. We have, um, I just completed some work in North Adams, out in Berkshire County, where we trained um, 25 recovery coaches, and part of that training had a training of trainers component. So now we have five trainers out in the Berkshire area. And that was one of those um, collective impact, the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition supported that training with some funding from HRSA. I would be remiss not to mention the Westfield State Program that I um, am coordinating that does a, a 11 Saturday program where recovery coaches are trained for all the coursework that's needed for certification. They come on Saturdays um, in September, October, November, and then they do an internship and they're getting their foot in the door. Um, and that's another HRSA-funded program. Um, the next slide, please, because I've got 30 seconds to talk about all this. All right. So where are recovery coaches? Well, you know, they're just about everywhere. Um, the green slides are where we have recovery coaches. I don't know if the colors are showing up there. Orange is where we're in process, you know, where, we, we, where we're really working with this idea of this is where reco recovery coaches belong. I will, I'm not going to stop talking until I talk about the red, okay? In the center, um, peer recovery centers are um, the, they're a, they're the mecca, they're the beacon of recovery in peer centers. Our last BSAS funding, there were two new centers that got funded for Western Massachusetts. One's in Springfield, and the other one is in Pittsfield. Okay, we had people in rural communities who, who put in, um, who applied for funding, and of course, they can't meet the funding, minimum funding requirements of the RFR. Peer recovery centers in rural Massachusetts do not need $400,000 which is what these centers are funded at. You know, we could do centers in rural Massachusetts for a quarter of that. So if, um, and peer recovery centers is where a lot of these other circles get the support that's needed to support the recovery for people that they're working with. So if we can think about how to do peer, how to find a way to fund peer recovery centers, you know, they're all scrambling for money and they spend so much time looking for funding that they're, they're not doing the work that they're really best at doing, which is supporting recovery for all people. Um, I'm going to stop there because the, the rest of this would take a long time, and we will have other opportunities. So thank you all. For <laughs> all right, I'm going to open it up for questions or comments. We have why is ECF in a white bubble? Um, ECF is, 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 oh. Oh. DCF is so involved in the lives of many people who are in recovery or need recovery or are seeking recovery, and we haven't got that right yet. Okay, so that that's why it's in the bubble. It's like we we need to work. Um, with coalitions and find a way so that DCF can become an ally in recovery instead of being seen as the enemy. Okay. I, I know Heather's on the board of DCF and could also chime in, but I know that DCF has made a real commitment to this by hiring more substance use counselors on their team, but they need and want more support in this area for the very reasons that had, um, Linda just mentioned. Um, a vehicle that we, we kind of, I don't know, identify somewhere in each session. Last year, last term, it was the Health Act, and we're going to um, get that back on track. You might have a better sense of the timing. You do. Yeah. Uh, just today, and I, I was actually, I got very moved by this because our timing is really good for this hearing. The governor just put out his health care plan just today. So everything that's going to get shared here, we'll be able to take and and roll it in with our colleagues in the House and the Senate. So 
your timing is great. Well, that's a great segue to my point of bringing that up, which is um, we. Uh, I think we should use this moment, everyone in this room and and uh, and and the four western counties, to be very clear for this vehicle because we'll have um, a possibly very different version that comes out of the Senate and uh, and the House, and and so we'll have real opportunities to say, okay, what is it that we want to change? Um, and this leads to my question: uh, Would you? I go back and forth on this in, in every issue we deal with, whether, whether it's a, a rural factor for ed funding or rural programming for rural schools, right? It's a, to what extent um, do we need to shift the formula that's applied within, say, DCF programming and, and other programming and agencies, and when we're looking at the allocation of funds, or is it, do you think we need a clarified agenda um, for addressing health in rural areas? And maybe it's both, um, but I just want to flag that. And but my real point is, I think a takeaway from today should be that we are being very deliberate in identifying how we're going to use this vehicle for um, addressing rural health issues. And, and I'm sure others will comment on this too. Um, Senator, thank you so much for the uh, commitment to look at rural health, uh, or, or not only rural health, but also uh, the for, for formula, education formula is what I'm trying to spit out here. And I think something similar for the delivery of rural health services would be very welcomed. Uh, I think to the point that Linda made too about the like funding minimums for uh, RFPs that come out, either they're population-based or you have to be an agency of a certain uh, annual budget. That also kind of rules out a lot of organizations in rural communities, even though they've got the drive, the, the expertise, and the passion to sort of implement and, and, uh, and pilot certain things. So if there were some kind of set-asides like that, you, you know, that that could be more considerate of the rural population, I think that'd be great. And others, I'm sure, have things to add. I just thought of a couple. Um, a couple of things that we've run into with uh, grandparents raising grandchildren is that um, if the children came to them, uh, say, one day of the week they were babysitting and then all of a sudden they are the primary caregiver, versus if the child came to them through the DCF system, uh, they're, they're treated differently in terms of how they support those children. Um, and, and I did learn that some of these older adults are uh, losing some of their senior benefits because they are raising children, which doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and some of it is systemic, so um, that would be something to, to pay attention to. And the other thing was, uh, I forget, but anyway, that's a good one. I think in the field of prevention um, and community coalitions, I think that rural areas are actually leading the way, and so what we really need is just um, to raise, you know, raise all ships. Um, I think for for primary prevention, we we just need to see Massachusetts invest more. I mean, our towns can't pick up other towns. More, you know, larger towns can fund preventions, and there are a number of larger towns that have prevention coalitions that they fund themselves. But we can't do that here. We need. We need state services, um, it, and that is what is going to reduce the, the disparities for rural regions, is just that increase in state, state services. Yeah, please, please. I think actually we can open it up to some questions and comments. Sorry, I know I'm not on this panel. Hello. 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 So my role as director of the health policy is that we are largely funded by accepting DCF because people don't even know the risk of the state of the community method. And it is the arm of DCF looking at social determinants of health, which is weird to think that DCF even takes that into account, but they do. And they're not within their own entity, they are not educated about the different pieces of DCF and how they work together. And this really trickles down to our community. So a frontline social worker working with somebody you were talking about supporting a grandparent may not know any of the services in their community funded by their community connections coalition that's home-based. Um, so there's like three tiers here. I'd love to see a couple rings around DCF in this colored thing and thank you for putting them in a bubble. 
they have a lot to offer. There have been funding formulas which have changed over the last couple of years to increase things like staff, knowing our logistics for DCF in our area, but it needs to be less statewide pushes and more support for area offices about what they really need for their community because child protection looks different across the state and in rural areas. There is a unique thing coming out that's being funded with federal dollars right now called the Kinship Navigator Program. And it's coming out to say things that communities have been saying for years, which is we need people to identify the informal supports around a kid and a family to step in instead of putting them into traditional foster care. But then what happens to those people? Okay, I'll take that kid on, but what about my supports? What about my housing? What about my services? And so this program is just being newly developed and they have a wait for it. Two people hired to cover the state of Massachusetts right now. <laughs> They can't even get from Athol to Greenfield in enough time to do, <laughs> maybe when we increase transportation. Um, but they, their existence is a huge step forward. So this is one of those things where the rubber meets the road, where rural health care disparities are really shown in tangible policy work that could be done. If we're looking at supporting kinship at DCF as part of public health, you're ensuring the feasibility for the family to have long-term success. Thank you, uh, Michael DeCiera. Um, So I'm starting to feel old. In a past life, I ran community partners, which um, worked with community coalitions. And so the four community coalitions in the state got money through DPH, which was a line item, including North Guavin. And those community coalitions were seen as the best practice. So in terms of prevention, in terms of getting the, all the community stakeholders together, so everyone who's doing good services knows who to call, that's something that, you know, it sort of got subsumed a little bit as each coalition ran out of money. but as a model, if you wanted to go back, especially in rural communities, because it was North Berkshire, it was on the Cape, it was North Guavin, um, really essential model, not a lot of money just to connect the dots every month. All right, last one from Glenn. Uh, Glenn Johnson, Greenfield School Committee. Um, went to a presentation by Lynn Lyons, who's an expert at youth, like depression and anxiety, and she was noticing a correlation between the social diseases are kind of going down, alcohol use is trending down, uh, sexual transmitted diseases among youth are going down, but the isolation related concerns are going up. So suicidality, depression, anxiety. And I'm just kind of noticing a connection like with rural communities, the increase in isolation, the increase in suicidality that we saw in the first set of slides and a, and a connection with what was said earlier that, you know, as white people, we had to be extremely cut off and disconnected from each other in order to genocide Native Americans and enslave black people. And so I think that it's increasing, but it's kind of a natural kind of result of a, of a culture. And I guess I, I, we're seeing in the UK, they're taking on isolation as an issue to, to take on and develop interventions around and we're hearing those threads with, the, with what you were just talking about. So I just wanted to raise that as a possible framework for people to be looking at just isolation as an issue for rural communities. Thank you, Glenn. That's really important and I, I'm grateful that you brought it full circle. Um, I wanna thank the panel so much. Um, thank you so much. We're gonna bring up the next panel. Very grateful. Um, there's been a number of folks who've come in. If you're coming in, welcome. This is a Joint Committee on Public Health hearing on rural health. It's being live streamed, so not only are we hearing it here, but people in the State House are hearing it. Uh, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful that you're all here. Uh, this next panel is actually going to focus on improving healthcare access and infrastructure. So improving healthcare access and infrastructure and and they're already forming because they're just on it. Um, so I think people are just gonna, we're just, we're getting settled. So welcome to Eliza Lake, uh, Dr. Esteban Garcia, Dr. Sarah Perez McAdoo, Ruth Blodgett, and Kirby Lacey? Lacey, I'm sorry, Kirby, Kirby Lacey. So I, uh, Eliza, I think you're first. Great, thank you. Where's the magic? First of all, is this working? No, eventually. And there's some number thing where am I? Oh, you're okay. 
Who is my uh, overlord right now? Okay. Um, thank you, uh, and good afternoon. Um, and thank you so much for having this listening session and for having it out here where <laughs> it hits close to home. It is in our homes. It is, you know, our lives. And so I really appreciate that. Um, we spend a lot of time going to Boston, so it's nice to have some of Boston come to us. Um, my name is Eliza Lake, as it says above me, and I'm the CEO of Hilltown Community Health Center. Uh, we operate sites in the small towns of Worthington and Huntington and the large town of Amherst, um, as well as a school-based site in Huntington. Uh, HDHC has served the residents of Western Hampshire and Hamden counties, regardless of ability to pay, since 1950. And we are the only provider of any of our clinical services, which are medical, dental, behavioral health, and optometry, and our community services, including domestic violence victim advocacy, in that region. As a result of some of the isolation of our communities and the complete lack of public transportation, as you will keep hearing about, um, in some of our towns, over 65% of the residents are our patients. We provide 41,000 visits each year to almost 9,000 individuals from 85 communities in Western Massachusetts. And if I had slides, I would have a slide of the state and show you how most of Western Mass is traveling to us despite the lack of transportation. Um, and I tend to scribble on my notes as I hear other people speak, and I have to say the word that has uh, jumped out at me is fragility, and particularly when I think about primary care. I appreciate Ed, my, uh, my colleague, um, talking about the assets, but I'm going to talk about fragility. Um, so there are many recommendations uh, in the Rural Policy Plan that are very important to rural communities across the state and to community health centers. Um, so rural domestic violence uh, funding and the recognition of critical access providers are two of these, but I'm going to talk about provider shortages. Um, and there are a number of recommendations related to provider shortages, so telehealth parity, student loan forgiveness programs, and the expansion of scope bills are all part of that a solution, but specifically I'm going to spend my time talking about the Health Center Transformation Fund. Um, community health centers are composed of the largest network of primary care providers in the Commonwealth, serving a million residents in the state annually. And yet half of Massachusetts health centers face negative operating margins in fiscal year 2019. These organizations are experiencing financial distress that requires relief just to maintain their operations, much less to address the growing challenges of the current health care environment. For rural health centers, this situation is compounded by our small size. We operate small sites so as to be geographically accessible to our patients. We operate in areas that cannot sustain larger private practices so that our patients can access care despite the barriers of transportation and geography. Doing so comes at a cost, though, not just to maintain, in maintaining multiple buildings and duplicated support staff, but in maintaining a sufficient provider base in this time of provider shortages. When a site that has one and a half or two or three providers loses just one person, and I keep saying this to my staff, it's one person, the impact is tremendous. One person changes jobs, as people always do, for a variety of reasons, and that can result in a 1,000 patients losing access to care, um, to, pri to primary and preventive care. That's their only option due to transportation challenges. Small health centers will do everything we can to fill in such gaps with existing staff, but these providers all work at other small sites that also depend upon their seeing patients in need. Recruiting a new provider can take as long as six months or longer, and while providers have to give four months notice, you notice those numbers don't add up. Um, and in the meantime, the health center may have to hire extremely expensive temporary staff, or regrettably, the situation can require hard decisions about reducing hours and cutting services. Besides the unavoidable impact on patient care and the increased inefficiency added to the healthcare system by this turmoil, this disruption severely affects health centers' revenue, which in turn affects our operational and financial stability. And that can make it harder to recruit the providers we need. And so it's a vicious cycle. The Health Center Transformation Fund, which I, um, I knew the governor's bill was coming out today, but I don't have cell coverage here because we're in a rural area, so I haven't been able to see whether what it includes. Um, but um, the Health Center Transformation Fund was included in the health reform bill last year, um, and it would provide support to struggling health centers to address their immediate financial distress. It would also meet the need for longer-term transformation investments that would position health centers for continued success as innovative leaders in the healthcare landscape. We were the first with community health workers in the primary care, I would say, and, and doing truly integrated care. Um, we hope that you and your colleagues 
uh, will support the Transformation Fund in any health reform effort in this legislative session. If all three contain it, that would be great, <laughs> um, but we, it, is, it is critically important. So thank you again for your support for rural communities. I know you all who are sitting here um, are very supportive of us, and I really appreciate for you giving us this time today. Um, good afternoon. My name is Esteban Garcia. Um, I'm a recent transplant from Brooklyn, so the rural community has been really interesting uh, for me. And the challenge that I really want to talk about today is um, recruitment um, as a, uh, for a hospital system um, to try to provide uh, more tertiary care to um, the area as well as primary care. Um, so I'm the chief medical officer at uh, Cooley Dickinson. Um, Cooley Dickinson is a full service uh, health system. We have both um, uh, that, that provides the Hampshire County and uh, Southern Franklin County, uh, provides inpatient care, outpatient care, primary care, subspecialty care, visiting nurse association care, and hospice care. We have lots of programs across the area. Our service areas include a mix of rural towns and small um, cities and a wide range of populations. Cooley Dickinson is a major employer in Northampton area and operates the only emergency department in um, Hampshire County. We have an affiliated medical group of 400 and our uh, Cooley Dickinson medical group actually has 140 employed providers, uh, 40 of whom are primary care. We have a mix of um, APCs or PAs and NPs and um, physicians uh, as well. One of our significant challenges and threats really is um, recruitment and Eliza and I uh, um, you know, commiserate over a glass of wine about this um, often. Um, it's, a, it's a real challenge for us to try to find physicians who are interested. Um, it's a beautiful area um, and other providers, it's a beautiful area and, and I love it as a recent transplant from Brooklyn. But um, I, we find that people need a reason to move here. They need to understand or have a link to the area. Um, and so that's one of the, er one of the um, challenges for us. The um, uh, AAMC uh, in the United States, the American Association of Medical Colleges, unfortunately has said that um, we can experience a 40 to 100,000 um, shortage by 2030 of, of physicians. Um, addition, additionally, one of the things that I, that I really am challenged by when I think about this is um, the U.S. Census Bureau recently reported that there's been a 25, since 2000, a 25% reduction in the number of physicians under the age of 50 in rural communities a huge challenge. Our physicians are aging just like the rest of the population and we're not replacing them. Um, and that's a real challenge for us. Over that same time period, this study found that um, there was a 3% um, growth in, ur um, in um, rural communities of physicians, but a 12% growth in urban communities. So again, a, a huge challenge for us. And um, it's estimated that by 2030, um, our communities will have one third less access to primary care than um, other communities in urban uh, um, areas. Um, so one of the biggest challenges that we have is that um, the funding for primary care uh, and uh, primary care is a real challenge. We have new recruits who are concerned about their student debt burden. And currently Cooley Dickinson in our area doesn't qualify for um, any of the um, HRSA um, funding for health profession shortage areas because we're not, um, Northampton is not an area, uh, an area that's listed as that or designated as that. That's a real concern for us because we do provide services for areas that are um, listed as health profession shortage areas. Um, the final thing that I'll talk about is um, telemedicine and the idea that we have very little telemedicine in this state um, and really need to explore ways um, that are recommended um, uh, to do that, including um, increased access. Um, we're looking at reimbursement parity, um, proxy credentialing, I really need to make this happen. We can work better with our colleagues out on the other end of the state by having telemedicine services that work. And finally, um, just a note to, um, I talked about recruiting physicians and providers, but it's actually so much more than physicians and providers. All of healthcare is a challenge for us in this area, and um, we support any uh, system that will bring in um, uh, additional resources for um, workforce recruitment, whether it's uh, nurses, doctors, um, MAs, um, looking at our community college colleagues to help us as well. So um, that's really what I wanted to talk about. Thank you so much for letting me come in. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to join this panel and um, and all the people in the room who are very passionate about improving rural health. Um, so I'm here today, um, this afternoon, um, in the role of um, over at Bay State, uh, UMass Bay State, um, which is the University of Massachusetts um, 
Medical School at Bay State Health. And UMass Bay State has a population-based urban and rural community health track known uh, by the acronym PERCH. And it is, it's a medical student track which emphasizes team-based care that is integrated within the community and focused on population health, healthcare disparities, and health issues that are specific to urban and rural communities. Now, the principles of, of the PERCH track are to develop future physicians who are empathetic, reflective, excellent diagnosticians, and are team-oriented leaders who can be led. And what we've learned is that health equity and social determinants of health cannot be taught and will not be learned in only one class. Instead, our team has created a longitudinal community education experience that augments the traditional biomedical education of medical students with knowledge and skills to understand and address health equity. This skill set prepares future physicians with the expertise and ingenuity to deliver quality patient care, improve population health outcomes in low resource rural and urban communities with high health needs. So this longitudinal education experience is informed by the community, the community health priorities that are found in the community health needs assessment as well as the community health improvement plan. And it includes the community voice, which is represented by the Bay State community faculty. And these faculty members are educators who are non-clinicians who live, work, play, pray, and age in the community served by Bay State Health. So our students um, from diverse health professions have the opportunity to become uh, AHEC scholars, and AHEC is the Area Health Education Center. The Bay State Franklin AHEC collaborates with academic and community partners in the Pioneer Valley region to address healthcare workforce needs specifically in rural and underserved areas. The AHEC scholars provide community-based and clinical training on social determinants of health, cultural humility, interprofessional education, and health equity, as well as some of the core public health issues that we've heard today. Students from various health professions who elect to participate in these training opportunities, and this is beyond their course requirements, are recognized as AHEC scholars. So we've also learned that immersive community-based education experiences activate student interest in rural health. So for example, um, we've had a student who was in the first year uh, during a community uh, immersion experience who um, also completed a summer service learning assistantship with the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. So this summer experience then evolved into a two-week rural population health clerkship during, during which a group of students from different health professions will live and learn in the communities of Greenfield. And in the rural town of Ware, the Quaybog Valley Community Development Corporation taught rural transportation as a social determinant of health, which is an issue that I have consistently heard throughout this discussion. So we picked that up in medical education. So the student experience um, that, the, that they had during the population health clerkship was presented at the Massachusetts Department of Transportation Innovation Conference, which then led to creating an application for a five-year grant to identify and implement a sustainable, scalable model for rural transportation. So this type of strategic collaboration with a community-based organization is an example of how medical education can directly impact social determinants of health and health equity. And lastly, when you think about innovative medical education programs at the University of Massachusetts Medical School on the Bay State campus, um, our programs better prepare health professionals to develop the clinical expertise within the context of, of the community. And this type of specialized uh, education will be valuable in training programs such as the Family Medicine Residency, which is being created here in Greenfield. Frequently, how doctors are educated and trained is how they will practice. So a doctor who is educated and clinically trained in social determinants of health uh, and health equity may be more likely to utilize these skills in their future practice. And this is a type of doctor who will be able to provide human-centered quality health care in rural communities. So to change the health and prosperity of rural communities, we need to scale up innovation, innovative education and training experiences of healthcare professionals including continuing to support and expand the area health education centers. Thank you so much for this opportunity. <laughs> but we thank Senator Comerford for hosting us and running around with the microphone. Uh, good afternoon. 
um, to this wonderful group of community leaders and legislators. Thank you all for being here today. Um, my name is Ruth Blodgett, and I'm the new director of the Bureau of Community Health and Prevention at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. I'm pleased to be here today to support this important work to address rural health priorities. After more than 30 years in healthcare leadership positions in the Berkshires, and I still live in the Berkshires, I welcome the opportunity at DPH to focus on strategies to keep people and communities healthy as we collectively face challenges of health inequities, new epidemics, preventable violence and illness, and increasing health care costs. Public health, in partnership with many others, provides an essential role and valuable solutions to improve health and well-being. This year, DPH is celebrating its 150th anniversary. And today, DPH has nearly 3,000 staff members that, that continue to carry on our mission to prevent illness, injury, premature death, and ensure access to high quality public health and health care services and promote wellness and health equity for all people in the Commonwealth. From food and water safety, hospital oversight, emergency preparedness, to data collection and analysis, DPH protects and promotes the health of, the Massachusetts, of Massachusetts residents. Data informs our decisions, targets our resources, enables us to continually monitor the state of public health in Massachusetts. Just as data is a central pillar of our work, so too is a focus on social determinants of health that create health inequities. Our push to eliminate health disparities for high priority populations, including those living in rural areas, is absolutely critical to our public health mission and vision. A few recent efforts include a special DPH commission on the local and regional public health was established in August of, six, of 2016 and in June released its final report, Blueprint for Public Health Excellence, Recommendations for Improved Effectiveness and Efficiency of Local Public Health Protections. The recommendations included fostering more public health shared services among municipalities to enhance the capacity to provide required services and protections, establishing a set of standards for the pub local public health workforce. Funding in the FY20 DPH budget will support planning for new and expanded existing shared service arrangements. The local and regional public health advisory committee will convene later this year to review the implementation of these recommendations. As many of you may be aware, our Office of Local and Regional Health includes a staff person assigned to work with boards of health in rural municipalities and provide assistance as needed. Oh, that's the stop already. That goes quickly. As, as those of you that have been sitting up here know. So I'm just going to mention the community health uh, worker effort is of course really important in, in rural areas. And I think the new certification program offers great promise. And this is an area where we will continue to, to strengthen that workforce. The last thing I wanted to mention uh, relates I think to a great opportunity in rural areas is the work that DPH has with the Massachusetts Community Health Fund and Massachusetts Healthy Aging Funds, which will help create conditions that will lead to better quality of life. Guided by Governor Baker's Council on Healthy Aging and Secretary Sutter's Health Priorities, these plans will invest significant resources in Massachusetts communities to address population health outcomes and social determinants of health through innovative, sustainable, and collaborative multi-sector approaches. The new resources are generated from healthcare entities' participation in the Depart uh, Determination of Need Program. And in the, the rules were revised in 2017, which led to the creation of a statewide grant-making capacity um, initiative. And the focus will be on communities that have not typically benefited from DON funds and historically have been left out of this funding. So it, it will be a, a great new opportunity for rural areas. I look forward to collaborating to provide critical public health services and keep people healthy and community strong across the Commonwealth. So I'm probably gonna go over my four minutes, but I'm gonna try and be as quick as I can with my comments. So good afternoon, I'm Kirby Lisi, and I'm the project coordinator for the Department of Public Health in an office that we have that's called the State Office of Rural Health. I'm also a lifelong resident of rural Massachusetts. The State Office of Rural Health is a program within the Massachusetts Department of Public Health um, in the Bureau of Community Health and Prevention, and we are first established in 1994. We're funded through three federal grants from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, um, along with a soft match of in-kind resources from the Department of Public Health. This program has developed a successful institutional framework that links rural communities with state and federal resources 
to help create solutions to rural health problems. The State Office of Rural Health has several functions. We link rural communities with state and federal resources. We collect and distribute rural health information and coordinate rural health networking activities. We offer technical assistance for planning, development, and implementation of local rural health projects. We help strengthen local, state, and federal partnerships, and we are always looking for ways to improve rural health. Additionally, we administer the mass rural health programs, including the Rural Hospital Flexibility Program and Small Rural Hospital Improvement Program. But most importantly, we work closely with our rural communities and healthcare providers to understand their unique needs. 160 towns, making up 53% of the state's land mass, are considered rural by our state definition. These communities encompass the Outer and Lower Cape, the Islands, a patchwork of towns in eastern and central part of the state, and finish with larger clusters in the west of the state in the Berkshires. Rural is across the entire state. I just want to point that out. <laughs> our rural communities are vibrant and resilient. They are incubators of innovation, creative problem solvers, and fluid in their ability to respond to adversity. They are home to incredible expertise, filled with natural beauty and resources, and home to many entrepreneurs and small businesses. Our rural communities also face challenges because of their unique needs. Nationally, rural Americans are older, sicker, and poorer than their suburban and urban counterparts, and that is also true of rural Massachusetts. There are 58 towns in the Commonwealth where 20% or more of the population is 65 plus. 50 of those towns are rural. The median income of Massachusetts rural communities is less than our urban communities by $12,000. They tend to be more economically distressed than their urban neighbors and pay more for service and utilities. Many of our rural communities rely on tourism as their main driver of economics. Tourism communities see a seasonal growth, but employment in this sector carries low wages for short periods of time during the year. Year-round resi residents must earn a salary to live on for a year in only a few months' time. Although we could talk extensively on the successes and challenges of our rural Massachusetts communities, today we would like to highlight four areas we think could have positive impacts. These include the rural health workforce, the rural health care system, telehealth, and rural equity in statewide initiatives. Many rural areas in the state have limited access to primary care, specialty care, and social services. The import, the, this has impacts on health outcomes for rural populations. In urban Massachusetts, there are 120 primary care physicians per 100,000 people, compared to 83 per 100,000 in rural Massachusetts. It's even more drastic when we start looking at specialty care, with 214 per 100,000 in urban, and 79 per 100,000 in rural. Our office works closely with both state and federal partners to provide support for recruitment and retention activities. The program we hear the most requests about, as you've heard today, is the State Health Professional Loan Repayment Program, um, which if we get funding for, allows us flexibility to go beyond some of the HRSA designations. Um, under the current program, 40 applications are funded out of 135 received, okay? And last year, six rural practitioners were supported through the program, and this year we had 14 supported. Rural Massachusetts has three critical access hospitals and three additional small rural hospitals. There are five federally qualified health centers in rural Massachusetts, and our office recently worked with several provider organizations to bring the rural health clinic model to Massachusetts. This model utilizes mid-level practitioners to help fill primary shortage gaps. We currently have three rural health clinic sites operational with another two opening in the coming year. They provide these all these different services, the, the bulk of healthcare services within our rural communities to both those who are publicly and privately insured. Nationally, since 2010, there have been 102 rural hospital closures. Um, and I think actually that number was up. I was at a national meeting. I know it's a stop. I got three paragraphs. I'm going to go. <laughs> um, so it is important to ensure access to quality health care services. One area of growth both nationally and within our Commonwealth is the use of telehealth. Telehealth allows specialists and subspecialists to visit rural patients virtually, improving access as well as making a wider range of health care services available to rural communities. It's also being used to help connect all levels of healthcare professionals to training, okay, and to provide support networks. Pilot programs in the state have demonstrated the positive impacts on both health and outcomes and the healthcare costs for rural areas. 
Healthcare services are not the only providers of health that need support in rural areas. Social services play a large role in the health of our rural populations. Regionalization and disinvestment in social services often has a disproportionately adverse impact on social services delivered in rural areas. In each year, between 1994 and 2001, the federal government spent two to five times more money per capita on urban community development as compared to rural. Nationally, rural areas also received only one third as much federal money for community resources as did urban areas. These historic decisions have lasting impacts and all of us have a unique opportunity to create equity for rural communities moving forward. Meaningful representation on commissions and committees from rural residents is needed. An understanding of the needs of rural communities and the impacts of program rules and funding should be included in our policy and funding decisions. Having rural advocates and experts included in discussions allows for an understanding of what unintended consequences may arise. All residents deserve representation. We must do all that we can to ensure that all underrepresented and disenfranchised populations have a voice and ability to enact the change that they need. In closing, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Our rural communities are primed for investment. Though they're through their incredible partnerships, relationships, and networks, they can create the rural appropriate solutions to the challenges they face. The Office of Rural Health has been working to empower and support our rural communities in the Commonwealth for over two decades. Hearings like this are the first step in achieving equity for all our populations in the Commonwealth. We welcome any opportunity to share our expertise, identify po potential solutions, and share rural best practices for statewide programs and policies. Thank you. I know, I know. I appreciate, I just want to say, I know we all share, <laughs> we all, we all uh, share an appreciation for the expertise of the panel and also just this wrestling with time. So I appreciate you all in, in how we're, we're proceeding apace. No, 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 not at all. No, no. I'm just, I'm holding it up, right? We're trying to, we're all doing our best here um, in this construct. So I really appreciate your work. Um, I want to recognize that Rep. Paul Schmidt has joined us. Thank you, Representative, for traversing uh, the Commonwealth to get here. Well, I apologize for being late, but uh, I have uh, great admiration for what you and uh, colleagues are doing. <laughs> well, we're happy. We need to join hands. We need to join hands. Okay, uh, now we're going to open it up for questions or comments. Yes. Oh, and then we'll um, I have to say, I'm just giddy that you're where you are now, Ruth. I know. This is great. Um, some of you know we, we worked together before I was in the legislature, and, and so to be able to go through this list of recommendations, I feel like we should set a meeting and figure out what it takes to kind of move some of these. Let's do it. All right, great. That's my question. Will you meet? Will you meet later? <laughs> Wonderful. Hi. Um, I'm with Senator Welch's office. Could you speak again to the role of the local health agents? Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay, but great question. I think, great, okay. Samin. Um, I'm just going to put my iPad down. Um, my name is Samin. I'm a uh, fourth year medical student who's taking a year off to do a master's in public health. I'm at Senator Comerford's office right now. And um, it's really great to hear, especially um, knowing that you're involved in grad, uh, medical education, that there's a push to have more primary care. But overall, since I've come here, I've been a bit disheartened, to be honest, because I'm interested in being a future primary care physician. But it seems like Boston on the whole, there just isn't a regard for primary care. For example, I learned that Harvard doesn't even have a primary care uh, physician residency. So I guess a, a key issue that I'm seeing here is it's being recognized again and again that there's a, primary, there's a physician shortage and a, particularly a primary care physician shortage. And while there are some steps being taken, which is really, really excellent, ultimately I feel like the issue remains. Graduate medical education, um, which is federally funded, is it's not increasing, so the issue's gonna persist. And right now, I think it's great that we're talking about nurse practitioners and things, but 
what is the push that the state can have to increase um, not only the funding for graduate medical education, but also once we receive that funding, make it an incentive for it to be used for primary care in particular. Um, and also, thirdly, how can we help with that culture shift that primary care is just as essential as specialty physicians? Because right now, it's kind of a community service that, oh, oh, you're going into primary care, that's cute. You know, like, um, you know, so I, I don't, I personally don't understand, you know, being interested in primary care, knowing the breadth of medicine that needs to be covered, I think it's, it's an incredible thing, it's super helpful. So what can we as um, in the legislation, in medical schools, in all these different spheres, spheres impact the culture, the funding um, that's needed to fix this issue? So I have a lot of things I could say about that. Um, <laughs> I think there are a few things. Uh, primary care spending in our healthcare system right now is 4% of spending. So 96% of money in the healthcare system go to something besides primary care. Can you say that again? <laughs> and someone can, I say these numbers and I would think, yeah, that's right. No, yesterday someone told me that is still correct. Um, that 4% of healthcare spending goes to primary care, which ref is reflected in the amount that primary care providers get paid, which with the cost, as you, you know better than anyone, with the cost of, of education right now, I honestly have a hard time saying to someone, yeah, you should come out of medical school with that kind of debt and take a job where you're not gonna be able to make your payments. So I think that the state loan repayment program, which was spoken about, I think is critically important. We are very lucky being a rural provider that we are Thank you. Um, often very successful in getting our providers that, um, getting them into the loan repayment program, which if they apply twice and get funded both times is $100,000, which is a fraction of, I know, of the cost. Um, but, and I've said this often, we can't use that as a recruitment tool very well because we can't guarantee that someone will get it. So we say, you come for work for us, a community health center, you can apply. <laughs> And we have really good luck. And sometimes that works. I mean, you know, and, and it's, it's very helpful, but it isn't enough. It isn't enough for us to be able to say, I have this pot of money and I can give it to you to help you with your loans if you come work here. Um, and then I think, and so I think that there's a culture change right now. You see it with ACOs and the Medicaid system. You see it, you know, in starting to recognize that primary care is the way you bring down the healthcare costs. And if we doubled the investment in primary care, tripled the investment in primary care up to 12%, <laughs> um, what kinds of cost savings could we see then in all the other realms? And I'm not trying to put specialists out of business, but you know, yeah. I agree completely with the primary care focus and mental health focus when it comes to providing healthcare. But the power of this setting and this group On primary care, I think primary care and prevention and looking at the, I think the changes that are happening around social determinants of health becoming part of primary care and building those relationships between primary care and the people, all of you who are working on social determinants of health is a critical piece of that. Um, just thinking about the fact that um, when you think about medical education, um, we forget how much that debt carries with you for a long time now that I've been out of school for a very long time in practice. Um, and you're starting to see now a recognition of that in a shift. So you're beginning now on the national level, starting to see a few schools that are offering free tuition. That's going to take a while to really take root because in certain situations, it takes them 10 years to be able to uh, gather the funding to be able to cover that. But that's not going to be so much of a luxury later on, it's gonna to have to be a significant piece of how do you recruit 
young people to go into medicine, specifically going to primary care. The second thing is that we don't use enough upstream um, strategies to be able to address this shortage. So I just gave you a small example of how the fact that we right now may not have the funding to say you can come to medical school, focus on primary care, focus on social determinants, work in rural communities. But um, when Dr. Garcia mentioned how uh, do we get people to be motivated to stay and work here, we're beginning to do that in this type of program by building the relationship with the community, that students start to understand the impact that education has on the community, not only that they're learning from, but that they're serving. So that even though that is not tangible in a, you know, a, a pot of money, what we're hoping is that by developing the community doctor relationship, at the very least, we're beginning to show how the education impacts the health, how that also impacts the health needs of the community. That's the responsibility we have to education, not to do it sort of like because it's nice, you know, necessarily, but because that type of training and education has a direct impact on the health and prosperity of the most, most vulnerable people in rural and urban communities. So there's still a lot um, that has to be changed, especially around um, uh, medical school debt um, and the way that we're using upstream um, strategies to be able to recruit more um, people to go into primary care. And I'll, just, I'll just mention one thing. I know we've, we've talked about this a little bit, but um, looking at um, exposure, I call it exposure to the area or really getting other um, our friends from the other side of the state here. We have a relationship now with the Institute, Institute for Health Professions where we bring PA students um, to Cooley Dickinson to do rotations, um, and there aren't, we're not a, a um, we don't do medical education, so there aren't competing. On the other side of the state, um, are the PA students compete for rotations with medical students from Harvard. And so these students are now coming to us, spending time with us, and then getting exposure to the community and exposure to what it means to be a physician, a physician assistant, a provider in our area, and really have enjoyed the direct one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, interaction with um, full-fledged trained providers as opposed to often with residents and others in some of the other areas. So it's just another way to, to increase, uh, hopefully, exposure to primary care. Hi, my name is Joanna Whitney. I live here in Greenfield. Um, I want to follow up on that uh, point about primary care and expand it a little bit. I have secondary progressive MS and uh, routinely deal with the challenges of negotiating um, both a complex medical system and a system that includes in the rural area a high turnover, particularly in primary care. Uh, there was a period, fortunately right now, that's not happening, but there was a period where literally every time I would go in for primary care, I would be seeing a new doctor because the person had left that I'd seen before. When you're dealing with complex and chronic medical uh, issues in a rural area where even just getting to primary care can be challenging and you've got this constant turnover, it makes it extremely difficult for people in our community, regardless of what their specific diagnosis is, to maintain the kind of care that gives the best possible outcome for their condition. So I'm just wondering if you can comment or... <coughs> I think one of the strategies that we're using to shift the way that um, we're looking at uh, caring for residents who have chronic health issues is that we're moving from, you know, the provider, the clinician doing it sort of solo um, to a more team-based approach. So you're seeing that in clinical care teams. So being um, leading the residency clinic that we had, the issue of having a different provider every single time was really very challenging to our um, our community residents were coming in with really complicated health issues. So we were revamping and, sh and changing. So now you have a whole team behind you. It shouldn't be just one person because all those team members are bringing a different level of expertise and value to your care. And if someone is not there, there should be another team member who understands your history, knows your story, and knows what's happening and can commu communicate that across other team members. We're also using that approach in team-based population health. 
that as a um, as providers of care, we're also looking at the community to be our team members. So if there are additional services that are needed to address chronic health issues, it's not only the responsibility of the institution, the place where you're going for care, but how do we partner with community-based organizations in the way that uh, will create a, a much bigger network um, of, you know, of partners who are working together with the same goal to improve health. So now we are beginning to see that actually in place, but I think that there's still more work to do to be able to um, find that across many places and that it's actually working really well in such a way that you're seeing a change in the way that um, people are being cared for and looking at the health outcomes that, you know, that it might improve. I just want to say, yeah, <laughs> it's incredibly hard. And I know, and, and we struggle with it and we struggle with making sure the rest of them, I mean, it's a, we, the employment market right now is really hard on all levels. And somebody, I can't remember, somebody mentioned that. Um, and so even keeping a team that's consistent is really hard right now. And I think that we are at a moment so someone, speaking of numbers that I don't know if they're real, um, somebody told me recently the average tenure for a PCP is 28 months right now, which seems really extreme. Like even I can't believe that, even with what I'm seeing, but I think it illustrates this. And so we have been talking about, there's an education piece for the community about this. I mean, this forum is sort of part of that, that unfortunately expectations of what we need from our PCPs are going to have to change until we can address the workforce issue. We're not, you know, which doesn't help you. And, and so I'm sorry that we're in the system right now um, because, yeah, it's really hard. Well, then but. I think, too, that there's, you know, we know that there's a number of solutions in some ways and best practices that have worked places but there's just not enough funding and resources to even begin to scratch the surface on this problem. And I will tell you that it is one of the most devastating parts of my job, um, traveling across the state and meeting with all of the folks that I do. Um, this is the number one issue and I don't have answers. And you know, that's really difficult when you do the kind of work that I do because that's my job. Like I'm supposed to help plug these systems together and you know we do the best we can on a shoestring um, to try and pull some of these pieces together but you know I think there needs to be a real concerted um, effort in many ways because it's it's the whole continuum of the system that there's challenges with from education right on through to loan repayment um, you know and you can't blame um, practitioners who have 400 you know we see the loan repayment applications they have 400 to 600 thousand dollars worth of debt and are being paid $120,000 a year, um, you know, and th those are big numbers. Um, and if they go into specialty um, or, or take a job in a more urban center, you know, they're going to start making two to three hundred thousand dollars in a year or two, um, you know. And so it, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to compete with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, once they get established, and yeah. It's... Oh, thank you. So I am a nurse practitioner, um, and um, I think there are some quick solutions. The first is that investment in NP programs has never been done by the state. You, there's no money that goes into the education of nurse practitioners, and then there's no money that goes into the training. Right now, nurse practitioners need to have clinical rotations within the community. That's done as in a volunteer basis for nurse practitioners. There are states that have already passed legislation that have done simple things like tax deductions for nurse practitioners who take on students. That's simple. That's a quick way to get people to do it. I currently have five, um, five post-grad residents of Great Barrington area who are all applying actively to direct entry nurse practitioner programs. They have families in the rural area and this is a way for them to have families be doing this work and stay in the community. And then finally, just quickly, because I think it's super important to remember, nurse practitioners have always been trained with this model. This is not a new model. We are all trained that way. This is the basis of nursing. This is why nursing is so important. This is why we do such a good job. And I, and I really appreciate all of the physicians I work with. I supervise them, which is great. They respect me, but you're right. 
Residents are being trained to be hospitalists, even if they're going into internal medicine. I think the focus needs to shift away from putting money into um, educating only physicians, start to move some of those resources into NP and PA um, educational systems and do some quick things. Thank you so much, such important, such important feedback. Okay, we're gonna thank the panel and move on. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a great question that led us to this next panel, which is really gonna talk about the infrastructure, the structure. Um, so Phoebe Walker, Laura Kitros, and um, Betsy Kovacs, please. Yeah, and we're, we're gonna move chairs around. And as we settled, just for the folks who are coming in, we had a lot of folks just come in. Um, this is a rural public health hearing convened by the Joint Committee on Public Health. It is being live streamed, thanks to the beautiful people at Greenfield Community Television. Um, we're very, very grateful to you. Uh, and we are going to be issuing a report for all of the colleagues in the legislature, House and Senate, and all of the leadership. And uh, if, you, if you missed this announcement, the governor just put out his health care bill today. So have mercy, this conversation is well-timed. All right, Phoebe. Thank you very much. And um, I wanna say that we are giving three slides on behalf of our colleague at the State Department of Public Health, um, Ron O'Connor from the Office of Local and Regional Health, and then we're giving our own. So in case you're wondering why we might get more slides, they're not really ours. He just, he just couldn't get here. Um, so briefly, the slides we're giving are about the Special Commission on Local and Regional Health that was uh, mentioned earlier uh, by Ruth Blodgett. And um, they pretty much all have to do with the prop I have brought here, uh, which is to show you that Massachusetts has 351 local health departments, Maryland has 24, California has 61, South Carolina has four. You get the basic idea. Um, essentially, all the things we are here to talk to you about is the flow from this map and the way in which our local public health system is structured um, significantly worse than any other state. I'm going to pass it over to Laura to tell us a little bit about the Special Commission. So this, the Special Commission on Local and Regional Health, is this on? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, was introduced several years ago. Phoebe and I both sat on that as representatives. Um, Really, why was the Special Commission started? We saw there were, Phoebe said, 351 communities. Is it any surprise that there's inconsistency across those communities? Small towns struggle, but big towns also struggle. We're here talking about rural health. It's particularly difficult for the small towns to have qualified, certified staff um, that they only need a few hours a week or a few hours a month. Um, but we also see struggles in the bigger towns. It's hard to do everything on a town-by-town -town basis. We see a lot of variability in board and staff credentials, and when I do my own slides as opposed to Ron's slides, I'm going to talk some more about those workforce credentials. Um, there's really a limited ability to meet uh, national standards of any type, including accreditation. And shared services is a new and growing way to, uh, it's not so new, in some places it's quite old, but it's, it's, it's a growing way to deal with some of these inconsistencies. But it takes money, it takes time, it takes commitment, and it's a slow process. So uh, the next slide, there are the commission members included. Those are some pictures of some of us who came to the State House to introduce the report when it came out last May. Um, it included executive branch agencies, legislators, appointments by the governor, including people from rural areas, people from larger areas, and then the named public health organizations across the, uh, the state. He's going to do the last slide on recommendations. And then we'll okay. Okay. Um, so the commission came up with, uh, after a year or two of work, came up with six interlocking recommendations, which are pictured here above you, some of which we're going to go over here because we think it takes uh, particular attention to the legislature. Um, but just across the top there, Laura's going to cover the workforce credentials. That when we say ensure continuity and sustainability, we mean of this system. Create a new system that's sustainable and, um, and that goes on and takes Massachusetts into at least the 20th century, if not the 21st, with its local health system. Um, and then in terms of set higher standards, that is that we think we don't actually have a state standard for what local public health should, should provide. But, we, but other states do, and we could, and we would like to start that process. All of these six interlocking things will flow from hopefully the passage 
of House Bill 1935, Senate 1294, um, which um, has had a hearing. Thank you to the Public Health Committee um, for that, but really needs to actually get passed in this session for us to start to make use of the two years of work and all of the good thinking that came into uh, the commission's report. So go ahead, next slide. No, there's a different one. No? Okay, well, never mind. You can go back to the data one. There was a slide that which we will see later, which is a description of all of the responsibilities of local boards of health. And I think you'll see it at the end. Um, just in case you don't know, and since we didn't get it in the middle here, this is everything from making sure your restaurant is clean to your kid is going to a camp that doesn't have uh, people with a uh, criminal sex offender uh, registry uh, working at it to making sure that your pool is actually chemically treated in such a way that it's safe to swim there to making sure that if you live in a house with lead, lead paint, your child is not being lead poisoned. These, it is a major determinant of health, what a quality uh, of, of local public health enforcement you have. This is who's making sure the water you drink is actually clean. Um, so all of those responsibilities, um, and we have no idea how well we're doing. I mean, this is one of the short findings of our commission is we're not really gathering much data on that. You know, we've heard, we heard this morning over at GCC, we heard today here about the importance of housing in, in people's health, and in particular in rural communities. There is not one data point about housing gathered at the Department of Public Health about how local public health enforcement is doing. Do, who, whose house are we inspecting? What are we finding there? Um, what, what did we order anybody to fix? What happened when we ordered them to do it? Did we go to court? Were we successful? None of this is being captured, and yet what's more important than having a safe place over your head? So um, I won't bore you with all the other things we're not, we're not actually capturing, but this is one of our core recommendations, in particular for your committee. If you were the legislature and the public health committee in another state, you could pick up a report that said, Oh, look, it's the every two years report on the Connecticut health system. I wonder how we're doing on lead point, or I wonder how we're doing on food safety. You don't have that, and we think you should, as should the rest of us. Next slide. Cross-jurisdictional sharing. Uh, near and dear to my heart uh, is uh, the creation of regional health districts. This is one way rural mass can actually um, get this work done and get it done well. We have numerous examples in Western Mass of regional health districts. This is a picture here of uh, the staff of the regional health district that lives here at the COG, a wonderful public health nurse who serves 14 towns, giving a flu shot to the health agent who serves 11 towns. Um, so uh, all under one district in a flexible way that works for its member communities. We'd love to see the commission's recommendation on funding rural health departments as regional entities uh, move forward. We did get some money in this year's budget, which is great, and grant applications are open now to folks, but it's a tiny scratch of what we would need to actually really roll this out statewide to have a decent local public health system. Now Laura's going to tell you about another few of our recommendations. You're going to say it here. So one of the things that the um, Special Commission looked at was the workforce qualifications and whether those workforce qualifications served Massachusetts. Currently, you need more credentials to cut hair to be the local animal control officer than you do to need be the health agent who's making sure your septic system isn't leaking water into the drinking water of your neighbor or into the drinking water of the town, who's doing all the housing things Phoebe talked about, who's doing food safety, who's doing half a dozen other things, all of which take specialized training to do correctly. And yet there are no statewide credentials required of them to do any of those things. Uh, this, not surprisingly, leads to a really inconsistent ability of the local Board of Health to provide public health services in a professional and uh, efficient manner. It means that there's a real variability across the state in local public health agents. Um, we see trained and fully credentialed people, and we see them in rural areas as well as in urban areas, so we do see them more likely in larger, better financed towns. And then we see where literally somebody gets elected to the Board of Health with good intentions, but with no experience, no responsibility, aren't getting paid, and they're out there doing it in their town. So it really runs the gamut from completely trained and credentialed to not at all. Uh, the pool and the pipeline for the workforce is completely inadequate. We're seeing large numbers of health agents who have been around forever and are doing a great job. They're retiring, and there is no one to replace them. There is no if you say, I want to be a local Board of Health agent, this is my dream in life to be, 
there is no school that you can go to and learn how to be a local public health agent. That, that does not exist, um, and that's a problem. And we see these problems are particularly acute in the, uh, in the rural areas. It's really hard if you're a small town of 700 people to hire somebody who's fully trained and credentialed and say, yeah, I, I, we really want you to have all this training, all these credentials, and you know, we'll hire you for three and a half hours a week. So, which goes back to the shared services um, models that Phoebe was talking about. Next slide. So the special commission had a subcommittee on workforce credentials. Uh, it was a big process. We got an enormous amount of feedback through both talking to people and through a survey. Um, people on that subcommittee included people from larger eastern uh, areas as well as um, a couple of us from Western Mass. And we came up with recommended workforce credentials, which were then vetted by the entire commission. They went back, they came back, they went back and forth several times for these various um, positions. So for health directors, people who are just overseeing health inspectors, for health agents who tend to do the management and the inspections, uh, for public health nurses, for inspectors who had a director over them, for administrative staff, and for board of health members who are also doing inspections or who are not doing inspections, depending on the municipality. Um, and there were three areas, what they should have when they're hired, what should be required when they're hired, what should be required after they're hired. So giving people time to come up to those standards. You know, For instance, inspectors, we, we think they should have a registered sanitarian degree at some point, but giving them sufficient time, six years, to come up to that standard if they don't have it. Um, and then um, things that are recommended. So for instance, we didn't feel like we could say Board of Health members should be required to have anything, but things that were recommended. Um, these are in the, the report, um, the URL is on the next slide. And um, there is a waiver process. It's not an automatic grandfathering. There is a waiver process where if somebody's worked for more than 10 towns, their municipality could request a waiver of the, um, of the workforce credential, of the, the educational-based ones, not of the certification-based ones. So these are the workforce credential uh, recommendations straight from the special report, uh, from the, it's not a special report, it's a special commission that had a report. Um, essentially, it says to, it, to set the education and training standards for local public health officials and staff and to expand access to professional development by these three bullet points, implementing the local public health workforce credentialing standards that were adopted by the full commission by making training available and accessible to local public health departments across the state. So many of these trainings occur out into Eastern Mass. If you're working three and a half hours a, a week or even 10 hours a week, and by the time you drive two hours to Eastern Mass, take a six hour training, drive back, well, that's the week's work. Um, so it's very, very difficult when these things, when these classes are only offered out in the Eastern part of the state, or even if they're offered in Worcester, which is kind of the compromise sometimes. And then finally, developing a system to track and monitor workforce credentialing. If we're going to require people to have credentials, we need to have a way of making sure that they actually have those credentials and that the people of those municipalities are receiving the services that they deserve. So I'm Betsy Kovacs, and um, I'm uh, representing Heath which you can think of as the poster child for everything that we're talking about. Um, I want to thank you for uh, listening to our needs. Um, and I just want to reiterate something that Phoebe just said, and that is the importance of public health as opposed to health care. And that public health deals with the environment in which we all live. And if you think about it, um, as Phoebe said, our clean water, air, safe homes, health promotion, disease prevention. I, it's hard to imagine that we would have the reduction in smoking um, that we have without the social marketing campaigns that uh, Massachusetts has been so um, much at the forefront of having done. But that's a public health effort. Um, so we are the um, poster child. and. Um, as for the needs described in the commission report. We need funding, we need training, we need additional personnel, we need all the things you've heard about. Heath is the quintessential rural tiny town in Massachusetts. We're the real boonies. 
with about 690 under 700 populations spread over 24.9 miles square miles we have a density of 28 per square mile we are the 15th smallest town out of um, the 350 towns in the state we're in franklin county on the border of vermont in fact many of us go shopping in vermont it's that far away um, with our more than 65 miles of roads and more than half of them are still gravel um, they go up and down hills as high as 2,000 feet we have huge snowfalls and great distances between homes and in the summer our population goes up on the weekends sometimes by more than a thousand people at a um, community uh, uh, sort of like a, co a, tram a camper cooperative but we're responsible for their public health as well when they're there on the weekend. And though we're amongst the tiniest of the tiny towns, we do boast the dubious distinction of having among the top 10 highest tax rates in the state. Yep, we have no local businesses and we have very modest homes. Our town's population is aging, many are on low fixed incomes. We have a dwindling population. Two years ago, we had to close our elementary school because of lack of children. Now we're saddled with a financial drain, an albatross of a building around our necks, which we have to pay to maintain, but has no use to us. So anybody want to buy a building? <laughs> no, a building. It comes with a bridge. In a nutshell, Heath is financially strapped. We struggle each year to provide basic services of fire police, highway maintenance, education, administration, same as all the other towns. Our total allotment for public health expenses is about $500 annually, salary for a 10 hour per week clerk, and 5,300 dues to the FERCOG Cooperative Public Health Service. And I'll talk about that a little more, the regional service. We do this with a five member board of health. We are all volunteers. We have a part-time clerk and a part-time town nurse who support and help implement our activities and programs. And while our volunteer board and clerk are devoted, dedicated public servants, major gaps exist in our ability to deliver quality and consistent public health service to our residents and visitors. We have several main issues. Number one, there are no requirements for serving on our board of health other than being willing to attend meetings and do a share of the implementation of the work. There are no training requirements, certifications, other than Mass General Law con Conflict of Interest training. This means, and where that usually comes in, is somebody might want to be on a board because they have a beef with a neighbor, and then lo and behold, <laughs> true, never happens. And lo and behold, they are in a butter, but etc. Um, this means we are usually shooting from the hip, not sure of what is expected of us, so we have, by law, extensive police powers, especially in emergencies. Two, we get no funding for dealing with disease prevention, health promotion efforts, aside from some minimum amount of pamphlets and distribution, um, and close to no support for emergency um, preparation. Training opportunities are usually held in places which would require an overnight or weekend time. Some of us do it, but most of us don't have the resources to. Um, we could not discharge our responsibilities without the FERCOG Cooperative Public Health Service, the regional grouping. For our annual dues, we get the shared regional services of a professional public health agent you saw his picture earlier, who does our Title V and food inspections, is, advises us on dealing with the sanitation code enforcement issues such as dilapidated and abandoned housing, condemnations, and enforcing public health regulations. This, the Cooperative um, Public Health Service also gives us access to a public health nurse who augments our town nurses um, programs such as flu clinics and communicable disease investigations. And yet, with all this lack of financial and human resources, our tiny town of Heath is responsible for providing 
the same exact public health protection and services are, as are required of all other towns and municipalities in Massachusetts. I dare say you wouldn't want your police chief to have the lack of credentials that most of us on our board has. So to do more than meet the minimal needs, of our community, we need additional professional credentialed staff. For example, we badly need increased nursing to do home visits to shut-ins and to provide better and greater health promotion programming. When we encounter emergencies and critical incidents is when we feel our lack of infrastructure and staff the very most. We often get ice storms, debilitating snowstorms, and just yesterday, we had no electricity in most every one of our homes in our town. The final electricity just went on, the final town, um, homes just went on this morning, I heard. Um, these emergencies can leave residents without electricity and heat, sometimes for days. And many of our residents don't have internet and those who do rely on slow service. So even if, okay, I'm gonna have to stop. But I see that I've run out of time. So I will leave the Triple East rep, which I'm sure you've all heard about. Um, Heath is at critical risk. And since we haven't had a hard frost yet, we still are until we have a um, really hard frost. Um, I'm going to make a plug. We need help with joining the Mosquito Control District. We badly need that, and it would be useful for the whole state. Our citizens in our tiny town of Heath deserve the same level of public health service and protection as the rest of the state. We're counting on all of you to provide the legislation and funding to help us make that happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to all three of you um, and your colleagues who contributed. I just want to raise uh, or highlight an issue that, that you touched on, I think, so beautifully. I don't have the privilege of representing Heath. However, seven of the top 20 towns with the highest tax burdens are in the Hampshire-Franklin-Worcester district, so just one to the east. And that actually speaks to this collision between provision of public health services and our small towns. I also just want to weave in a little thing called pilot, payment in lieu of taxes, which is um, also really falling quite short. So many of our states, uh, many of our towns, including Heath, Warwick, uh, Coleraine, Royalston, they actually care for a number of acres. Uh, in, in Warwick's case, it's 50% of the town, uh, acres of state-owned land. Arguably, we want that land. We need open land for all the reasons we know environmentally. And yet we've uh, actually decreased our pilot payment from the state. So we are really having a collision embodied by your remarks, right? We are cutting the pilot payments to the, from the state um, to these towns. These towns are hitting uh, top tier tax brackets. Um, and we just aren't seeing enough economic growth to generate income. Now, that's not saying that the kind of efficiencies you're looking for aren't also needed. But that's, I think I just wanted to bring that economic reality in the room with all of you. Um, questions? Questions or comments? Other questions or comments? Oh, please. Carolyn. I, I just want to say that um, I'm chair of the Board of Health in Deerfield. I'm a select board member. And I'm one of those people that was not ever qualified to be on the Board of Health. I um, have no background. I found out I had the Board of Health job when I was elected select board a few years ago. So it, capacity is an issue and money is an issue. From a budget point of view, there's never going to be enough money, so we need to be creative. And it's capacity. We have to be offering some kind of training. Because as communities out here, we do volunteer. And we do have the ability to take care of our communities because we do care. There are people that care. But we do need training. And you cannot do this without training. So I think training is really important. The other thing is you have regular Board of Health issues, but then you have emergency preparedness. And there is no support for emergency preparedness, really. And, and that's where, you know, maybe we can do the team approach. We're trying to, I also co-chair the Mohawk Public Health Coalition, and we are trying to figure out ways that we can deal with, um, 
you know, the team approach where we can support the fire and the police and the emergency managers in the town because every all those positions really are underfunded and or volunteer. The other thing is we got to really be smart about climate change. No one is bringing up that climate change is affecting public health terribly. And um, I'm Deerfield was the lead community to support um, the establishment of the Pioneer Valley um, Mosquito District. And what I think is really important is that this is a new line item. All our towns, when we're spending almost 70% of our budget for education, and we have a shrinking you know, base, tax base, most of us, and, and a growing population on fixed incomes, we've got to figure out a way to deal with climate change diseases. Um, ticks are coming. We need to support subsidized tick testing so you can get treatment within that um, one week of um, that golden week, just like the golden hour, and UMass will do that, but you need money to do that, and that should be done. Um, the other thing is the Mosquito District, this is a new line item, and uh, costs for, uh, it makes much more sense to have data that shows where your mosquitoes are, and then you lava side them rather than doing useless spraying at the end of the season. So it's, for us, it's let's have a little bit of money so we can be flexible and creative and try to figure out what we're going to do. And just a quick, you know, um, back a couple panels ago, what, what's happening with the health care system is it's shifting down to the cities in Springfield away from us in the rural areas. So there's no transportation really for our elders to get down there for medical treatments. It used to be a neighbor will take you down to Greenfield or wherever to go to your hospital, but going to Springfield is another whole thing. And they're usually elders themselves. So having some kind of medical support for transportation is really crucial to our, our elder population so they can go to appointments. Do you want to address any of that? No? Okay. <laughs> okay, when you are when you are in the system that that we have right now in Massachusetts, where you're not required to have a credentialed health department and and staff, you don't necessarily have somebody who can say, oh, put together a tick testing collective. You know, that is something that that comes out of regional health districts. You know, comes out of workforce credentials, comes out of having professionals there to sort of respond to whatever emerges public health wise. And that's where we need to be, which is where literally, you know, 48 other states are. So we are, we need to get there. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, friends, this is our last panel. Um, and this is really looking at the social determinants of health. Uh, head on. Now, it's not to say that other people who have spoken today haven't talked about the social determinants of health. They've been in the room with us. This just gives us an opportunity to focus. So please welcome uh, Stuart Beckley, David Christopoulos, Dr. Theo Huang, and Patricia Crosby. Great to see you. Um, thank you all for being here for this uh, important issue. I really want to extend the thanks to the um, Rural Policy Plan uh, Committee and all the people who worked on it and gave input. Uh, it is an incredibly important document. Um, I'm Stuart Beckley. I'm the town manager for the town of Ware, uh, which resides at the far east part of Hampshire County. And um, But today I'm going to be talking about um, the necessity of a particular regional project that uh, we 
host with the Quaybog uh, Valley Community Development Corporation. Is it okay if I stand? Can I come? I guess so. I was late with my slides. I, I got it. Thank you. So, going old school, old guy going old school. Um, so, what we call the Quaybog Hills or the Quaybog Valley is really the South Quabbin area of Massachusetts. Um, here's Massachusetts, here's it's highlighted. Uh, the purpose of my discussion today is primarily these lines that do not run through our region of the Quaybog Valley. Um, the lines over here to the right represent the transportation system PDTA of Springfield. The lines over here um, to your right uh, represent the Worcester transit system. The big void in the middle, that is us um, in terms of transportation. Uh, there is this line which will collect, connect through Palmer to, to Springfield. Um, and you can see the area to our north, similar to uh, parts of Franklin County also void. Um, so it's shown as a best practice in the uh, rural plan, but what I'm going to talk to you about is the Quaybog connector, which was put together, as I mentioned, with the town of Ware and the CDC and covers 10 towns now. Um, it is now almost three years old. In that three years, it has grown from two riders per month to 66 riders per month. To now a thousand riders per month. It's um, it's uh, held together by magic uh, <laughs> and and a, and, a, and a, a lot of su uh, subsidy and um, support from uh, the Commonwealth, from foundations, um, from private sector, including uh, Bay State Health, which recognizes one of the main purposes for the system is to get to medical appointments. Uh, without the Quaybog connector. Um, many of the people in our area, uh, which covers the, the corners of three counties, would, would be missing or dropping medical appointments. And it's an incredible, important piece. 60% uh, of our rides are for employment. Uh, so those are people who uh, would not be getting to, to work, not be getting home. So our original plan was uh, 8 in the morning to noon, 3.30 to 6. That fell apart within two weeks. Uh, we uh, run from 6 in the morning until 8 at night now and are seeking funding to expand that through um, uh, Mass DOT and we've also put into a, another um, grant to expand uh, the purposes and the region because as I pointed out to the north there is also still no service. Uh, PVTA has dropped our service to four runs per day. There's only two connections going east to Worcester, uh, which are important to uh, members of our region because that's where the uh, Eastern thank you, District Court is located. Many purposes that we're working on. Um, so one note I would like to make, um, there is a group, uh, Western Transportation Forum. Next meeting is November 1st at PVPC. It uh, met Northampton very successfully a few weeks ago. Even as we're talking among our rural selves, it's important that we talk to each other and not just talk to the policymakers um, or, or the urban areas. Uh, we have accomplished a great deal. There are other people that have accomplished a great deal, but we don't always talk to each other. And uh, I think that's an important piece that should be included in any work that goes forward with policy. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Comerford, for coordinating this, and uh, thank you for all of you legislators for uh, taking an interest in supporting the rural revolution. Um, my name is Dave Christopoulos. I live in Goshen, and uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about housing and how it relates to the social determinants of health. Okay. So I'm going to say a little bit about that. I'm going to give you my opinion. I'm going to give you some facts and probably a little anecdote. So we're talking about housing, a pretty complex issue. Is there a screen slide up there? Don't look at it yet. You don't have to put that up there yet. That's the end. Um, 
it's complex. I'm not going to talk about syndication. I'm not going to talk about tax credits and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you're developing housing in Massachusetts for people who really need it, you got to know what those things mean. That's a little technical, but it's a problem. So um, when we talk about housing, we're talking about a physical thing. What we're really talking about here is someone's home. It's an abstract thought. And really what it gets to, to me is it's really about our existential health. That's what I'm interested in, our spiritual health as people. And when we look at a rural area, when we talk about rural living, I'm interested in economic geography as a lens to look at it. There is a uh, radical known science uh, that looks at this stuff. It has to do with spatial relations among people, and power dynamics. Uh, I think it's important for us to be thinking of these things when we're talking about where people live and what their lives are like, because that's what we're talking about here. And I also think we're talking about government action, not private action. When we talk about housing and the history of it in this country and the segregation and the policies that were condoned by our government, this is government action. That's what we're talking about. And that's why I'm looking at you guys, but I'm talking to the room. Because that's our way out of it. Because that was the way in. Um, so I'm talking about our culture and who we are as people. Our geography in rural Massachusetts really dictates how we develop our communities and the limitations and opportunities that we have. And it does contain the past history and the power dynamics that exist. Rural housing is built into the landscape. It was often created as part of a rural agricultural system. We still live within that legacy here, Massachusetts. We have the oldest housing stock in the country, probably, most, most of it. Um, and our existential health is related to a sense of place. Yeah, we need good air quality and we need to get rid of the lead paint, that kind of stuff. Um, our economic lives are impacted by unaffordable housing and cost, high cost burdens. We, you guys heard the statistics, right? We gotta drive all over the place. You add that to your house costs and you're up in the 60, 70% just to get living and driving. Never mind all the other stuff. All right, so that's an issue for rural people in Massachusetts. And um, real estate continues to reward the rentier class. Let's face it. You've got money and you've got property, you got a good chance of getting more. The general population has to pay larger percentage of our income to maintain housing costs and the wealth generated by real estate transfers continues to happen. It's a small elite group of Americans that own all the land, all the housing, they're controlling it all. It's government action, remember that. Uh, so we have old housing stock, it's fact. We're far from services, it's fact. Transportation costs more. We have limited affordable housing. There are short-term rentals and second homes that are making, uh, putting pressures on us in rural Massachusetts. We have expensive, uh, it's expensive to property manage if you're a developer like our nonprofit and we're trying to provide housing to the people who need it the most. We have long distances, not many vendors who do the work. We have zoning issues to deal with. Uh, we have geographic issues, ledge, costly infrastructure. We don't get money for that. One thing that we've done in the Hilltowns uh, is we have done a lot of housing rehab to help preserve the housing stock. We've done over 700 homes in the Hampshire Hilltowns. And I want to make a point about this. Not one of those dollars for the housing rehab program has been state money, it's federal money. And we should do something about that. Um, the other point I wanted to make was uh, that uh, there are things that we can do to get a better handle on how people can be healthier in their homes. And there are things that we are doing and a lot of developers are doing. I actually brought it checklist here, how you can walk through a home and figure out the healthy things that need to be done. When we have a home, we do this stuff. So um, I don't have it on the screen for you, but what I do have, I know I got my 30 second thing. I just want you guys to see the recommendations. I'm a commissioner on the Rural Policy Advisory Commission, part of this uh, plan I helped write. And uh, if you look, I think is up there now, are the recommendations. Okay, so they're very complicated. Housing is very complex, technical, and not something you can do in four minutes. So um, what, yeah, what we're looking at here is, I mentioned rehab, we need to support the rehab needs of this old housing stock in the state. We particularly need to focus on low-income people and people of color. 
we need to revise the community scale housing initiative. It's good, but it's not good enough. Uh, we need to look at the regional solutions, just like your public health agents and your other shared services. We need to look at that for um, housing. We need to build capacity in our rural areas to develop. I can speak by experience. I'm a developer. I've built a number of housing units in the past 10 years, and it's near impossible. We're doing it against all odds. Uh, we need to create more flexibility in the state funding, and I'd like to talk more about that in detail when we get more of a chance to do that. Thank you so much for your time. It's nice to be sitting next to another economic geographer. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's see, we can throw up a slide, I think. Um, yeah. So uh, the economist Raghuram Rajan in his book, The Third Pillar, writes, communities matter. Perhaps more than any outside influence other than the parents we are born to, the community we grow up, grow up in influences our economic and health prospects. He continues, communities get trapped in vicious cycles where economic decline fuels social decline, which fuels further economic decline, which leads to a deterioration in the environment for children, resulting in poor school performance, high dropout rates, increased attractiveness of drugs, gangs, and crime, and persistent youth unemployment. The opioid epidemic, he states, is just one symptom of the hopelessness and despair that accompanies the social breakdown of once healthy communities. What we find in our next slide uh, at GCC is a microcosm of our community at large. 12% of our student body experienced some degree of homelessness. 35% reported low or very low food security and 48% reported housing insecurity and 58% reported having basic needs and security in the last year. So when you have 58% of a community struggling to meet basic needs, there's a crisis, right? The authors of the Wisconsin Hope Lab report, Still Hungry and Homeless in College, state the obvious. Basic needs and securities are associated with poor academic outcomes. Housing insecurity has a strong statistically significant relationship with completion, persistence, and credit attainment. Other researchers have found associations between basic needs and security and poorer self-reported physical health, symptoms of depression, and higher perceived stress. As this community's college, we have decided that the appropriate response to these kinds of challenges is increasing access and support for students engaged in education so they can overcome these deficits and that, that lack of basic needs and gender. Uh, education changes lives for the better. Kathleen Porter writes, college graduates also enjoy benefits beyond increased income. You can change the slide, I think, yeah. Uh, uh, including a positive correlation between completion of higher education and good health, not only for oneself, but for one's children. In fact, parental schooling levels are positively correlated with the health status of their children and increased schooling are correlated with lower mortality rates for any given age. Public benefits of attending college inclu include increased tax revenues, greater workplace productivity, increased consumption, increased workforce flexibility, and decreased reliance on government financial support. In order to grow as a community, we must break the cycle reinforced by a lack of basic needs. Greenfield Community College is a site of transformation where we are working every day to help students with expanding their opportunities to develop a meaningful, rewarding, and healthy life. We are working to transform our communities through economic opportunities engendered by a creative, innovative, and dexterous workforce. In addition to our traditional academic, professional, and workforce certificates and degrees, we're also dedicated to providing pro programs for people in recovery, the incarcerated, adults returning to school, high school students struggling in the traditional school system, and supporting all our students with a wide range of services, including a college food pantry, counseling services, resources for women, veterans, students of color, and so many others. The key to a comprehensive community college is to build on the assets of our region. Together with our community partners, like everyone you've heard from today, we are rewriting the narrative of Franklin County and the region as one where physical, social, and economic uh, health are all intertwined and codependent upon one another, and that together we can make a significant difference on all those measures to help the region become a place where dreams and possibilities are realized. And this is done through supporting higher education, but also pre-K through 12. And, and really the whole system 
if you really want to make an impact on, on, on health and, and the well-being of our communities, I think including all the places that need funding now, that's a place to start. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to speak a little bit about work as a rural um, social determinant of health. We all know that a job is what puts food on the table and a roof on our head. Maybe we don't think so much about the fact that we can, uh, it is also what gives us a sense of purpose, um, of self-confidence, of self-esteem, and makes us get up out of bed in the morning. And it makes it a, that makes it a particularly important um, determinant of social health. It, what we may also not think of is that in a rural area, um, there, may be, there may be additional and other barriers um, that uh, rural people um, experience when they are trying to um, uh, uh, get to work um, or prepare for work. Um, those are issues of um, just plain availability of jobs, a variety of jobs. We, there are jobs open in this region, and we do have people interested in them, but there's a uniformity to the jobs open that can get discouraging sometimes. Um, there are people who do not want to be necessarily a certified nurse aide or a truck driver, um, and they also don't want to be limited. They might be willing to take that as a starting job, but they want to be able to go somewhere from there. Um, the um, access to the jobs and access to the training for jobs. Um, so just being able to get there just being able to get their second or third shift, just being able to get there d during the daytime, uh, just being able to get there if it's a little out um, anywhere in the county, but also many people have to travel outside the county. Many people are expected to travel to Springfield or might need to travel to Northampton or, or Vermont. And it's really hard to do if you're poor and you don't have a car. It's really hard to do it even uh, locally if you don't have access to um, uh, really generous um, public transportation routes that go beyond what the, the current capacity we have to do is. Um, it's also about the ability to um, navigate toward a job and advance once you get in, in a job. In a job, those are skills that need to be built. Um, that's guidance. That's um, um, exploration and awareness as a starting place. It's also practice and guidance. Working with workforce professionals who can help you figure out. Um, how to get past the um, uh, 100 question online interview people might ask you to go through first, um, then get through a face-to-face -face interview, um, and then negotiate once you get the job, uh, how, do you, how do you succeed at it, um, and keep people in, and uh, impress people enough so that they want to keep you and advance you. Um, so if you go back to the, this one uh, here, yeah, I wanted to say a little bit about the region um, as a workforce region. So we're the largest one in the state geographically, 1,400 square miles. Um, 47 of the 50 communities, when I looked at the map in this book here, um, fit the definition of rural. We only have 125 employers with more than 100 employees. Very, very, very different from the eastern and central parts of the state. Um, the wages have been consistently in the 20 years I've been doing this job, 65% of the statewide average. That says something about the kind of jobs that are available. 70% um, of the residents don't or can't travel out of the Franklin Hampshire workforce region to work. Um, so it isn't always a solution. I mean, when pe people, we're, we're asked to work regionally, we do, the Pioneer Valley region, and people talk about all those casino jobs coming in. It's not, it's not a, a realistic option for the people who want to do that work um, to go back and forth to those casino jobs, especially at entry level. Um, and approximately 20 to 25% of the people who come into the career center on the intake survey uh, say no when you ask if they have a reliable means of transportation to education or work. Now you can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, the workforce, and I want to talk a little bit about the workforce system and specifically the career centers that serve the area. We've had a 35% cut in federal allocations to those services, public employment services that everyone is, is, is entitled to um, in the past uh, maybe three years or so. As the unemployment, the official unemployment rate goes down, the allocations go down, the formula. Um, uh, it makes them go down too, and they go down from the state as well. Um, we now have only one full service career center for that huge area. So we uh, consolidated into the Greenfield office people in Hampshire County 
um, can access satellite services through partnership with the Forbes Library and, um, and with the help of the um, mayor of Northampton, but they can, they can get started. They can't get comprehensive services. They can't see a WIOA program all the way through the training um, portion. They need to see a counselor face to face for that. And many of them um, just can't um, put in that additional time. Um, in Hampshire County, ironically, here we are in Franklin County, we're always talking about our needs here, but it's actually, someone was talking about it earlier, with the consolidation of offices, offices have consolidated north and south to the Springfield Holyoke area and north to the Greenfield area. So it, I, we, we're noticing there's no DTA services in Hampshire County. There's no MRC services in Hampshire County. And now there's no employment services in Hampshire County. I'm certain other agencies can acknowledge the same. We know there's no community college in Hampshire County. The two, the, the three colleges in the Pioneer Valley region do a great job um, uh, helping to serve that area, but it's not the same um, as having an educational center right downtown. Um, so so it's, it's, and the other thing I was thinking of when um, one of you was talking, I'm not sure was, but consolidation of services is not just a loss of services to people, it's a loss of jobs. It's a loss of good jobs in the, in it, it, um, it affects that mix of jobs I was talking about at the beginning. I've gone way longer than four minutes, haven't I? Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, I see it. Um, so um, we have done some, we have, I think we've done as partners, community partners, some terrific things. Um, you know, people, uh, entities like the, Gen the Greenfield Community College, the Literacy Project, um, working with industry sector projects with Franklin County Technical School. We've identified the areas like manufacturing jobs that have better entry level wages and that also have opportunities for advancement. We've come up with good programs to help address them, um, to help place people in them. Um, that bottom statistic, over 85% of the 150 under, under, underemployed workers in those manufacturing programs were placed in jobs um, and currently that, that rate is 18.30 an hour. Last slide. So these are the key points I think that affect workforce development as a um, determinant of health is that um, transportation. We really need transportation in this region, transportation improvements. We have high hopes for a pilot project, uh, the same source that you were talking about there, Stuart, that we submitted uh, recently that Andrew Baker from the Workforce Board um, worked on with the uh, Council of Governments and um, FRTA. It would address needs of second and third shift manufacturing and healthcare employers and people who want to get to those jobs on second and third shift. Um, and that would be a great um, opportunity to, to get something started. Um, we, um, we need stable and sufficient funding for, for core career center services and we need multiple access points. And by that, the satellite services are good. We also have some in, North, in the North Quabbin area, but full services um, in more than one area in this huge region would be um, really um, uh, much better. Um, we hope you'll continue to reward partnership as a way of maximizing our resources. We're used to that and we do it well. Um, but there's also something in the study that talks about a, uh, thinking about a rurality factor, taking into consideration in RFPs and in funding that the costs are more and different um, uh, when it comes to rural areas and that we, we need to have some leeway to describe what our needs are, why things might cost more because of transportation costs. And, um, and why it's important that our region as a rural region be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Hines. I'm looking at that rurality factor uh, and seeing you all over it. Uh, Senator Hines in education has been leading the way um, along with uh, Superintendent Michael Sullivan talking about low and declining enrollment, right? So that's one side of it. It's the rurality factor and then it's the also the scale that so many people spoke to today where we don't have the scale that the state understands. And so they think, oh, yeah, I don't, we don't know what to do with you. You're smaller than our usual East Coast program. So I think it's a, it's a both and, right? Um, comments or questions from, from my colleagues? Oh, Representative. Well, I just wanted to uh, uh, appreciate uh, today's effort. Uh, two of the communities that I represent, Westport and Freetown, are part of that rural patchwork uh, on the eastern part of this state. Uh, and even though we're cheap by jowl to uh, urban areas, Fall River and New Bedford, uh, many of the issues uh, that I've heard today uh, really resonate with me, particularly uh, the lack of transportation. And I personally uh, get heartburn uh, every time I see how much 
uh, we're spending uh, on the MBTA and how hard it is to get $92 million rather than $90 million for public transportation for all the rest of the state. So thank you for everything that I've heard and I look forward to working with my colleagues uh, uh, to address these issues. Love your, uh, I love the heartburn comment. I think those of us out in Western Massachusetts get heartburn too, right? The, the RTAs serve a larger service area um, than the MBTA, and yet the MBTA gets way over a billion dollars. And we struggle, as you say, um, in the last budget to get 90.5 million. So the regional inequity um, and the inequities with the RTAs are just profound. It's great that we have great colleagues across the Commonwealth and in the region who want to roll up our sleeves. Um, do you want to say something, Adam? This is the last panel, is that right? So maybe I'll, I'll provide a, um, an appreciation for you for doing this. No. Oh, I am not allowed to, pr thank you. Okay. No. Okay. Um, I, I guess what you're hitting home for me again is, is when we talk about, we, we're here at a, a healthcare gathering and we're talking about these other factors and um, it, it strikes me time and again that we can't be looking at one issue and, uh, and say, here comes the health care bill and, uh, and, and ignore all these other aspects. And, uh, and yet we do, I think, for, for, for sometimes good reasons. Um, but I think I appreciate the work that you're all doing to remind us that it's, it's, it goes well beyond that. Um, and I'll continue to think about ways we can articulate that in the forthcoming health bills. So much and the reason I, I i didn't say that we were closing yet actually is because i i want to first of all i want to thank our panel so much um thank you for talking calling out the social determinants of health um there is of course there are many many social determinants of health you beautifully laid out a number of them um we've also talked about things like access access to services and there are people outside from the mass nurses i love the mass nurses um and they are calling us to attend to the threat of a closure um, of mental health care facility up here in Franklin County. I see a lot of uh, nods. I, am, I, I share concern, um, and so, so, so do many of my colleagues in the region. And so um, we wanted to make space if there are mass nurses who would like to come up and talk about it, uh, because this is, part of, this is part of what we talk about in the rural area when we talk about social determinants of health. We talk about how far do people have to go um, before we get services. So I wanted to make sure to make space. Um, for our colleagues. Thank you, Senator. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, for doing this. Uh, this is such an important um, information gathering that we're doing and, and talking to each other. I am Donna Stern. I'm a full-time psychiatric registered nurse. I, I've dedicated my entire life as a social worker and a nurse working in rural communities and specifically working with people living with mental illness and addiction. And so I wanted to talk about my, my deepest, deepest concerns about the slated closure of the inpatient psych unit at Bay State Franklin. Um, as, as you've already talked about and identified today, all the barriers that exist in living in rural communities. So access to, to transportation, isolation, desolation, poverty, all of these things are multiplied by 10,000 when you're living with mental illness. And the idea that we would make it that much harder for people to access and good, good quality um, acute psychiatric crisis care, because that's what we're talking about. When you end up on my unit, that means you're in a mental health crisis. And making someone go 45 minutes away who's already living in poverty. More than 90% of the people that I work with are homeless, are battling dual diagnosis, so meaning they have a major mental illness and drug addiction. We need to make those services affordable. We need to make them accessible. We need to keep them here in Franklin County. And, and so part of the opportunity to speak today is that we need to keep talking about it. it we cannot pretend that this is not slated to happen. We have to fight it. We have to stand together and we have to, to fight for, for people who don't have a voice, 
to the people who are not here today um, for multiple reasons why. Um, and so I want to thank you, Senator, I want to thank you again for, for the opportunity. Um, you're going to keep seeing me out there. I'm not going away. And uh, legislators, thank you for your time. I want to introduce Suzanne Love. Hi, my name is Suzanne Love, and I am one of Donna's coworkers. I work at the emergency department here in Greenfield at Bay State Franklin Medical Center. And the closure of the mental health unit at Bay State and other two other rural hospitals in this catchment area um, is concerning because I see people stuck in the ER because there's no mental health bed available for days. We recently had someone in our apartment for 14 days in the ED, and we are really providing three hots on a cot. We need more psych mental health beds, and it's really important to people. What I hear working at the triage desk is people coming up, treasure to be seen, and sometimes they'll specifically say, I'm here to check into East Spoke, which is how we used to name our mental health unit. Because they know it's a family atmosphere, they get provided good coverage, and their family can come see them. These people walk to the hospital to get care because they don't own a vehicle and don't have a family member who owns a vehicle who can take them to where they need to go to get care. So it's important to provide good, sound mental health care for these people who are in these crises, but it's also important to provide it where they can easily access it. As we talked about in many different contexts today, Local access is really important. Thank you. So, good afternoon. My name is Timothy Randy Blake, and I am your cultural diversity today. Now, uh, I recognize that in this room, that's not quite true, but that's the way I've often introduced myself. I am black. I am gay. I am a Vietnam, uh, Vietnam era uh, veteran. I um, am a consumer of mental health services here at Bay State. I uh, am a member um, of the Recover Project, which means I am connected with uh, communities that are dealing with substance abuse, as am I, and mental health issues, as am I. And one of the things that I am able to do, and I have seen it here today, talk about how we can make things different just by making some little changes. So um, we cannot, um, give a gas card to someone to say, can you give me, can I get a ride somewhere? I can do that on my own, and I do. I know all the routes to all the detoxes. I can get people to Keene, New Hampshire, to a social security office faster than I can get them to Holyoke. And one of the things that bothered me most when I heard about this proposal was again, the issue that says if our transportation system is so tragic in the first place, why are we going to make it worse for people who have the least amount of issue uh, with uh, stability? So what I would like to say is we cannot fix everything all at once. I wish. Um, but where is in this plan to close these three rural psych units where is the plan to beef up the transportation for that? If we can't fix it, can we at least beef it up some way so that people don't have to think about going into a further depression about how do I get to where I need to go for what I need? So with everything else that we need to do, I'm going to encourage people to be more people-centered, more person-centered, um, I've, I've got a lot that I'm working on and I'm going to try and get, and I just made a connection with Carolyn Ness. Um, uh, I, you know, so, uh, you'll see me standing next to Donna. I come from people who started an NAACP branch in Mobile, Alabama in 1927. I cannot go back. I've worked with people who have been in combat in Vietnam and other places, and I cannot go back. I am married to a wonderful man. We just celebrated 35 years together, 15 years um, of a legal situation uh, of, of our marriage. And there's too many people who came too far for me and I can't go back. So thank you very much for listening and um, call me. <laughs> Thank 
Well, um, that was about the best closing as I, I could ever imagine. Heartfelt thanks to you. Um, you know, your charge to us is we can't go back, right? We can't go back to the status quo for rural health. I want to just shout out that Rep. Terry and I sit on a committee that's de dedicated only to mental health and substance use. This is public health in the legislature. You know, we have these, some may, maybe, too rigid um, delineations, but in the mental health and substance use committee, the issues that you're all speaking about are front burner all of the time. We, I don't lead that committee, but I know our colleagues are thinking about this a lot in the legislature, all of the issues you just talked about. So we can't go back. Um, we can't go back in the Commonwealth uh, for regional inequity. Um, and we must, must make the kinds of gains that all of you have been leading and many panelists have spoken today about. Um, and I wanna thank again, the Franklin Regional Council of Governments, Phoebe Walker has been a tireless partner in this. Um, and I just really wanna make sure that I shout out Maria, who is a public health, um, a public health grad student who has been taking documented notes. So all of the videotapes and the notes are gonna be compiled and sent to our colleagues at this very timely moment uh, when healthcare will automatically be ratcheted up to the front burner. And we will be able to, as a team, advocate for the kind of rural health um, advancements that you all have been talking about. So heartfelt thanks to all of you and GCTV, you are angels, uh, to be able to stay here and capture all of this. This will also be online. Um, thank you to Chair Mahoney and to uh, the public health fellows in my team and to everyone for coming. Really, very grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you for watching GCTV's coverage of the Rural Public Health and Healthcare Legislative Hearing. Visit our website at gctv.org to watch a rebroadcast of this program.